This week's episode feels like the other side of the same coin as last week's episode. Maybe that's why I was drawn towards wanting to tell it. Also, I wanted to dig into this story because this tale is actually a much weirder side of the coin. Uh, Telling another story about a parent being involved in the murder of one or more of their children, and just like Alec Murdoch last week, not seeming too publicly shaken up about it. What is the biggest social taboo you can think of? Is it killing your child or having your child killed by someone else? In talking about so many heinous dirtbags over the years here, we've dealt with a ton of social taboos. Cannibalism, necrophilia, serial rape, extreme incest and molestation, sexual attraction to gore or torture, and on and on. But we haven't had many stories centered around a mother murdering their children. Casey Anthony, while not convicted, I do believe she killed her daughter. Uh, Belle Gunnis, while we don't have any hard evidence, I think she killed several of her kids. And there's probably someone else uh, we've covered I'm forgetting. But the point is, it's rare. It goes against pretty much every image we have of mothers, of someone caring and kind, someone exceptionally nurturing, someone who would sacrifice anything for their child or children. To much of the world, motherhood is a sacred role. Made iconic in religious figures like the Virgin Mary in Christianity, uh, Durga, the supreme mother goddess of Hinduism, uh, Tara or Tara, the mother of all Buddhas, and Gaia or Mother Earth. All these figures embody compassion, purity, goodness. And it seems that most of us have an idea that mothers in general, even people who are, you know, still complicated and fallible human beings, meat sacks like the rest of us, they usually want the very best for their children. And yet the tragedy of maternal filicide or child murder by mothers has occurred throughout history and throughout the world. Usually based on research published in scientific journals, it happens most often as a result of psychosis. According to one study, mothers who murder their children are often poor, socially isolated, full-time caregivers, uh, who were victims of domestic violence or had other relationship problems. The stress compounded and compounded until they snapped. That will not be the case at all with today's subject. Lori Vallow is no victim. She seemed to have everything going for her. A beauty queen contestant from a wealthy family, she grew up in San Bernardino, California, in a neighborhood described as country club-like. She had so many advantages. She had a loving family, although maybe one member uh, of her family, a little little too loving, as we'll see, and the support of a solid LDS community. And although she seemed to run through husbands pretty quick, uh, the perky, blonde, cheerleader-esque woman was able to charm her way into just about anything right up until her big first and final arrest. Overall, she lived a charmed life. She was even once a perky contestant on Wheel of Fortune. She would have two children, Colby and Tylee, by her second and third husbands and adopt a third child, a little boy named JJ, with her fourth husband. A lot of marriages, but she experienced a lot of financial security. She lived uh, in all kinds of places, from Texas to Arizona to Hawaii, often in big houses with swimming pools, all kinds of modern luxuries. And then in the middle of what seemed like her best marriage by far, Lori started getting weird with her religious beliefs, like real, real weird, apocalyptic, and well, completely insane. She met others who shared a similar vision of her uh, insanity, her version, and then things started getting so much weirder, dangerously weirder. She soon believed she was on an important mission from God, one of God's chosen warriors. And to help God out, a lot of people would need to die. A lot of of zombie people. Buckle up for a wild ride this week. A true crime meets cult meets what the fuck is even going on in this story set largely right here in Idaho edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) Happy Monday, meet sex. Uh, Welcome. So the cult of the curious. I'm Dan Cummins, Luke Suckwalker, uh, president of the Charles Ramsey Dead Giveaway, Dead Giveaway Fan Club, Low Country Solicitor Oversight Committee Chairperson, and you are listening to Time Suck. Hail Nimrod, hail Lucifina, praise Bojangles, and glory be to Triple M. Uh, I had some episodes of me on some other podcasts drop recently, so uh, check them out. Check me out on Annie Letterman's Annie Wood and the Sklar Brothers Dumb People Town, also co-hosted by the very funny Daniel Van, Van Kirk. Uh, I had a great time on both shows, especially fun to reminisce about uh, old times with Annie and hear her insane story of ruining an important sitcom writer's white couch with her period blood. Not kidding. <laughs> Actually, if you like uh, some of my stories about uh, more extreme things like uh, a sexual rendezvous with a banana in a grocery store bathroom, you will also love Annie's humor. I find her uh, very funny. And now let us begin. Uh, let us explore a real fucking crazy, thankfully short-lived 
and very murderous Idaho-based cult, 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 cult. After a quick summary today of where a lot of the story happened, who the major players were, and what they believed, I'll lay the story uh, out you know, fully in the timeline. Some of the most dramatic elements of this crazy story played out over the past few years in Rexburg, Idaho. About a seven-hour drive from Suck Dungeon, around 470 miles from where I sit, which for those of us living in Idaho or just the Pacific Northwest in general, uh, people used to long drives via the interstate or two-lane highways between places. It's not really that far. Rexburg is a place you might go to stay while hiking in the nearby Tetons. Tetons? <laughs> Or just uh, before you enter Yellowstone National Park, about two hours away, uh, Rexburg also less than 30 miles from uh, from where my dad dwells. Yeah, that dad. Guy living in Idaho Falls, past six or so years, so close, so conveniently close to where the most heinous crimes of this story took place. You know, living there when these crimes occurred, uh, I I gotta wonder, did the police at least question him for any of these crimes? Because uh, I know for a fucking fact, he doesn't have an alibi. For, uh, you know, the times when uh, some or maybe even all of these crimes uh, took place. Oh, and I forgot to uh, point out last week how Dad Watch could have really helped prevent the crimes of Alec Murdoch. Had it existed in South Carolina's low country several years ago. Of course a dad did what he did. Uh, this week, might want to, uh, might want, this, this might want to make us launch a Mom Watch as well. What would, what would Mom Watch, what would the acronym stand for? How about, uh meticulously observing maternal women assholes trying to commit homicides. I feel like that plays. Anyway, Rexburg, uh, also home to one of the largest Mormon communities outside of Salt Lake City and the largest in Idaho. With an estimated 95% of the city's roughly 40,000 person population identifying as LDS. City also home to the BYU-Idaho College campus, a school known as Rick's Academy and then Rick's College for the first 99 years of its operation. Story played out among a community of fringe LDS members who believed that Rexburg would become a very important place in the end times, which, which of course, you know, we're fast approaching. And many of the cast of characters in today's story naturally believed that they would have major roles, very important people in the end times. They would become the saviors of Mormonism, leading the 144,000 faithful to save the, uh, to be saved in these white camps. Uh, The number 144,000, uh, Mentioned the book of Revelation has been interpreted in different ways by various denominations and doomsday groups for years and years and years. Latter-day Saints believe the 144,000 are high priests who will administer the everlasting gospel to the world in the last days according to the church's doctrine and covenants. The idea of tent cities or cities of light, that's a common theme in the literature of the Latter-day Saint prophecy subculture. The term white camps made up by Lori's last and worst husband, Chad Daybell, and likely refers to white tents often seen in LDS people's visions, thought to possibly refer to the divine protection these uh, tent cities will receive during, uh, you know, big final apocalyptic battles. The idea of locating a site to weather the difficult time period preceding the second coming of Christ is a revival of 19th century LDS efforts to gather in the Rocky Mountains for safety. This concept of gathering in the Latter-day Saint tradition is how God protects the righteous during the apocalypse. And no one was going to be more righteous than Chad and Lori. Uh, Chad and Lori both grew up in uh, both grew up LDS, and a lot of their ideas are rooted in some way in LDS beliefs. But their version of these beliefs, you know, it's just it's so incredibly twisted. It doesn't end up having much to do with mainstream Mormonism beliefs at all. Uh, their beliefs wouldn't even really be based in the teachings of any FLDS fringe groups either. Chad, uh, the source of all this shit, just kind of came up with his own thing, his own horrible thing, and Lori loved. Chad's thing. And you can interpret that in a variety of ways and it'll be true. She left all of Chad's things. Uh, Lori and Chad would belong to a small group of people, most of them women, who believed Chad Daybell's visions wholesale. Daybell claimed two near-death experiences in his late teens and early 20s. Uh, He claimed that they left him uh, with with a special connection to the spirit world. As an author, he later wrote about his experiences, including additional visions of the future his connection allowed him to have. Many of Daybell's fiction works focus on end of times, doomsday, apocalyptic scenarios, floods and fires, the country erupting into civil war, etc. Much like the same kind of bullshit other doomsday motherfuckers we've covered have preached. But Chad's take on it all, uh, while sad, of course, because of the people who will die in the story, also is highly entertaining. It was like, this shit is so fucking ridiculous. It was like he and his followers 
were just constantly playing this improv game <laughs> when they were coming up with Chad's bullshit where you just never said no, no matter how ridiculous the idea was that you were supposed to riff off of. Like whatever crazy idea anyone tossed out just got incorporated into the ideology. Just so much just yes and. Uh, Chad was a frequent guest at preparedness conferences and appeared on a lot of prepper podcasts, both being places where other LDS people desperate to be stars of some apocalyptic, there's never been a more exciting time to be alive than now, Earth's final battle action flick, flock to hear about how to live through the apocalypse. It was at one of these conferences where Lori first met Chad, and together they'd form a tight little circle around them of true believers, a circle of friends who believed all the fucking loopy, zombie-laden shit they were espousing. So what did they believe? Basically, they all came to believe that they were reincarnations of biblical and real world figures, larger than life figures who had been brought to earth to fulfill God's mission and cleanse the world of evil. Totally. Of course, of course they were. God chose these fucking idiots <laughs> to lead us in our final days. It's the same story over and over. It's just a f- couple of fucking losers. The God's like, nah, th- these are the, these are the saviors. Uh, we've heard the story so many times and I never get tired of it. <laughs> Still very entertained by the powerful elements of self-delusion and narcissism that just feed this particular ideology. You know, we are the most important people who have ever lived. And that is why God chose us. The way Chad told it, each world in our universe was created with a Satan figure and a savior, or really multiple saviors and devils over the centuries, though, of course, Chad and Lori were the most powerful and final saviors that earth would ever see. Uh, The fifth world in their idea of the universe was earth which is in dire need of spiritual cleansing. And Lori, Chad, and a few others would, you know, purge this world's evil by, well, uh, uh, focusing really hard on it and uh, talking about frequencies and vibrations and doing rituals and shit. Uh, Don't try and make too much sense of any of this. A lot lot of these people are truly fucking idiots. And Chad is a shitty prophet who, despite making a living as an author, uh, is actually a terrible writer whose books and prophecies are riddled with plot and logic holes and a lot of contradictory beliefs. Uh, These weirdos would end up believing that they could control the weather, (laughs) throw psychic fireballs, uh, cause thunderstorms and earthquakes, you know, and and then then these natural occurrences would then, you know, kill evil people and and all kinds of other shit. Like, Like, these are the people who, you know, truly would believe that, of course, the Library of Alexandria was once full of powerful wizard fireball scrolls, a loss to history until they figured out how to do that kind of shit on their own. If you were a savior, you could attain these powers because of your high vibrational level, which meant you were essentially light. Oh, fuck yeah, bro. Uh, Chad was mixing in some new age vibration talk into fringe LDS beliefs. I love it. You know, cooking up quite a cult stew of various wackadoodle notions. Uh, Dark meant, unsurprisingly, the opposite of light. And anything dark was of the devil. Classic traditional doomsday battle lines being drawn, right? Light equals good, dark equals bad. I got to keep the core belief simple so that the peasants can easily digest the gist of this stuff. Uh, Chad came up with a scale of one to six to assign just how light or dark someone could be. At Lori's request, he once emailed her about how this list worked globally and uh, where her family members, you know, fell in this list. (laughs) He sent her a chart that stated, "I I just love, by the way, sending this not as a joke. Not as like, I'm just being absurd, but like, this is some real shit. He sent her a chart that stated, current numbers on earth at this time of each estate level. These totals represent the light spirits. The dark has equal numbers. And then beneath this, he's got three columns. (laughs) There's estate, males, and females. And basically estate just means level, right? So estate six, level six. Uh, The highest estate or level is only five males and two females. The seven most powerful light workers well, I guess five most powerful light workers on earth and then two fucking evil demon zombie like monster, like like the big boss monsters. A state 5.3. I don't know why it goes from six to 5.3. Zero males or females. I don't even know why that level exists if no one's on it. A state 5.2, 71 males. <laughs> Zero females. Ah, gah, oof, a lot more righteous men than there are righteous women apparently. A state 5.1, 133 males and only four females. Oh, that's that's awkward. State 4.3, uh, jump it down a bit, 700 males. Oh, but up, okay, 1,300 females. Interesting, didn't expect that shift. More good women than dudes on that level. But, you know, but only, only there's only more women on the lower levels. 
Sorry, ladies. Estate 4.2, 7,000 males, 13,000 females. Estate 4.1, 70,000 males, 130,000 females. Estate 3, 700,000 males, 2.3 million females. And estate 2, billions of males and billions of females. And there's not not a one. There's not an estate one. Not sure why that isn't uh, there. But again, it's not like Chad was real worried about, you know, any of this making sense. Underneath the chart, Chad wrote, most LDS members are level two, like level two light workers. Most bishops and ward leaders are level three. Most stake presidents and general authorities are level four. Okay. Most apostles are level five. A few, like a, a few are level six. And also the dark can only match the light numbers, not exceed them. It repeats that there. That is why there are a few fives on earth right now. It limits the dark's power. Uh, twos and threes are fluid and can change sides during earth life. <laughs> 41 and above have made covenants to their side. They rarely switch. And that was the end of his message. You, you, you got that, peasants? Uh, then after laying out how this very logical and obviously correct system worked, he wrote to Lori uh, about where her family fit into all this. He wrote that her first husband was a 2L. Okay, your base level good guy. Right, kind of like a fighting man, generic good guy. That's fine. Uh, her second husband, 2D. Ugh, not good, just kind of a basic, you know, a uh, soldier of Satan, not very powerful, like kind of like a like an orc, I guess, maybe just a low level monster minion. Uh, her son Colby, three L, that's great, nice, uh, bishop level god wizard. Uh, Colby's wife Kelsey, uh oh, three D. At the time of this email sent on October thirtieth, two thousand eighteen, Ugh. Kelsey every bit as wicked as Colby is good, and that was why uh, Kelsey didn't like Lori, right? Because she was a devil witch. Lori's third husband, four point three. D, holy shit, so much zombie in him. Lori's fourth husband, 3L, oh, whew, okay, all right, another strong light worker. Uh, her adopted son, JJ, 4.2L, so good, uh, but her daughter, Tylee, ha, ah, this is unfortunate, 4.1 dark uh, spirit, it's very wicked, powerful devil witch, able to take on uh, and maybe even destroy a state president, it's dangerous, probably can shoot fireballs or at least raise the dead like some type of necromancer. Both Lori and Chad had reached, uh, you know, of course, the highest level of lightness. They were perfect sixes. It's uh, incredible. Also an odd number to associate with being super holy. Uh, I've mentioned the word zombie several, several times now. That's not random. In Chad's belief system, if you were dark, you were some sort of demonic zombie. <laughs> Once Lori and Chad identified anyone as a zombie, uh, they began using pseudonyms to refer to the evil spirits that possess them and zombified them. <laughs> Examples include Lori's husband, Charles Vallow, who they would often refer to as Ned, Garrett, or Hiplos. Uh, those were his demon zombie names. Tylee's evil spirit was called Hillary. <laughs> of course, obvious not to Hillary Clinton. Uh, not sure where the other uh, names came from. Uh, I didn't know, you know, Ned was a big name in demonology or anything. Tammy Daybell's dark spirit, Chad's wife, uh, would be referred to as Viola. <laughs> Another very interesting demonic name choice. To deal with these uh, strangely named devil fucking zombie spirits, Lori, Chad, and their circle would have prayer-like ceremonies where someone would read forms of scriptures and encourage spirits to vacate the bodies of these people using the power of God. It was like, kind of like a remote exorcism, but one where you would also then have to find and kill the host later for some reason. Once a spirit was pushed out of a body during the casting, well, then the body must, you know, obviously, naturally, then be destroyed by being burnt uh, torn apart, uh, bound, sealed, like suffocated so that the spirit couldn't, you know, come back into the body. Did I mention how dumb all this is? Uh, some members of this little cult Chad built apparently thought that this destruction portion was just metaphorical, you know, not so different from talking of reclaiming one's power or shutting out negativity, but for Lori and Chad, at least, and well, and Lori's brother, Alex, not the case. They will literally get some bodies destroyed. Okay, one more thing now before we get into this weird ass fucking timeline. Uh, I'm going to deal with a big cast of characters today. And it's worth introducing them all uh, up top here in order to help, you know, reduce some confusion later on. So first and foremost, we have Lori Vallow, the star of our show. Uh, she would also be known as Lori Cox, Lori Ryan, Lori Daybell. Parents, Barry Lynn Cox and Janice Cox. So much Cox. Not a single Richard in today's suck, but plenty of Cox. So write that wrong. Uh, Lori has two older brothers, Alex, uh, Alex and Adam Cox, the Cox bros, old double Cox. One older sister, Stacy Cox, as well as a younger sister, uh, Summer Cox, the Cox girls, Triple Cox. 
Uh, man, Summer Cox. She never got teased for that name growing up. Not fucking once. Lori was the biological mother of Colby and Tylee Ryan, the adoptive mother of J.J. Vallow. Colby, her oldest child, born uh, October 8th, 1996. His dad was Lori's second husband, William Lagioa. Tyler was, or Ty Lee, was the second eldest, born September 24th, 2002. Her father, uh, third husband, Joseph Ryan. Colby will never know his biological father and take Joseph's last name as his own. Uh, Joshua J.J. Vallow was the adopted son of Lori and her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, born May 25th, 2012. Also the grandson of two other people who will show up in the timeline, Larry and Kay Woodcock. Cox and Woodcock in the same story. It's, it's got to be good. Uh, Kay Woodcock, by the end of this tale, will also be Lori's ex-sister-in-law. Her brother was Charles Vallow. Charles and Lori adopted J.J. because he was family and partially due to him having uh, pretty severe autism. His parents were unable to take care of him. Lori's first husband before the fathers of her children was Nelson Yanes, whom she married in 1991, and he got off lucky. Got off before the crazy really kicked in. Uh, she'd marry William Lagioa in 1995, leave by 1996. Also got off pretty lucky. Uh, he may have been a douche, but maybe not. It's hard to trust what uh, what she says about these people. And then following her fourth husband, Charles Vallow, there was fifth husband, Chad Daybell. His parents, Jack and Sheila Daybell. And he has two brothers, Brad and Matt. His first wife was a definite zombie, Tammy Daybell. The two were married in 1990, and they will have three kids, Emma, Garth, and Seth. And those are the main characters. And it's truly fucking shocking how many of them end up dead in this story. Let me tell that story now, starting with the marriage of Lori's parents. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. On November 19th, 1965, 18-year-old Janice Connor marries 24-year-old Barry Cox in San Bernardino, California. Barry Cox. Not gonna lie. Pretty bummed that his name wasn't Harry. No way kids at school ever called him Barry Harry Cox growing up. That never happened. Uh, Janice Connor, now Janice Cox, had small features and a big bouffant of black hair. <laughs> Which, now that I have Cox on the brain, it makes me think, I just picture her head being just full of pubes. Just a nice foliage of, of pubic hair uh, up top. Uh, she'd graduate from Eisenhower High School. Barry Cox was tall and thin. Could be described as long and hard. Somehow always landed in the very center of photos of the San Bernardino High School's acapella singing group where he was the leader of the bass section. A Barry Big Bass Harry Cox. Uh, the pair would live at a home on North Sycamore Ave, long curving road that hugged the vast greens at the golf course at El Rancho Verde Country Club. People who grew up in the area called the neighborhood simply the Country Club. And through the 80s and 90s, it was considered to be where well-to-do families and members of Rialto's upper crust chose to live, a Rialto button up next to San Bernardino. Many houses had a view of the course with the San Bernardino Mountains in the distance. Cox home was one level with a wide driveway, four bedrooms, nice swimming pool in the backyard, living that California dream. Janice would be a homemaker. Barry would make his money working at a life insurance agency as an estate tax collector. For a time, he worked for Beneficial Life Insurance, which was owned and operated by the LDS Church. And yes, the Coxes were Mormons, big gaggle of Mormon Cox, uh, devout attendees at their local ward of the LDS Church. But maybe not quite as conservative as some of the other members. Might have been, might have been some zombies in the Cox clan. Janice sometimes would sunbathe alongside the pool, as in wear a bathing suit that would show off most of her tits. And all of her upper thighs. <laughs> what the heck, Janice? That Cox lady liked to live dangerously, I guess. Uh, Barry Harry Cox drove a flashy car with rabbit fur seat covers. Okay. And the family often flew to Hawaii for lavish vacations where they would all show a lot of cock skin down at the beach. Backing up to the very beginning of their marriage now. Less than a year after they got hitched, uh, Janice gave birth to her first child, daughter named Stacy. Rest of the Coxes would arrive in rapid succession. Alex in 68, Adam in 69, Laura, who died as an infant in 1971. Lori arrived in 73 as the second to last Cox, or is it Cock? Summer, born in the summer of 1975, hence her name. And then I guess they finally felt like they had enough Cox living under one roof. Lori was born Lori Noreen Cox, June 26, 1973, the year after Lori was born. Barry ran for city council in Rialto hoping to, quote, reduce all unnecessary spending and also make uh, any mockery 
of the name Cox a fucking felony punishable by death. Uh, or maybe just the first financial thing. He came in fourth place. This poor showing may have been due to Barry's fast and loose kind of Mormonism. Not everyone loved the ways these cocks lived their lives. Barry was often loud at church in moments that were dedicated to silent worship. Shut the frick up, Bear! And neighbors recalled that he was gone a lot while uh, Stacy, uh, the eldest child, would be in uh, charge of her siblings even when Janice was still home. Janice probably too busy uh, tanning her level three dark zombie tits out by the pool, a.k.a. Satan's sin pond. The Cox children weren't allowed to do much, and because they were different, as one former classmate later recalled, most other kids did not like them. To the point that more than once, the Coxes woke up to a front yard covered in toilet paper. Coxes getting teepeed. This didn't seem to affect Lori as much as her siblings, though. She was the most uh, desirable cock. At Ben Cold Middle School, Lori sang in the school choir, wrote funny messages to her fellow singers in their yearbooks, such as, uh, have a great summer, P.S., don't get pregnant. <laughs> oh, Lori, how would that even happen if they weren't married? What a silly goosecock you are. At the end of eighth grade, Lori had blonde hair and chubby cheeks, played on the church softball team, which was coached by her mom. Uh, she also liked to lay out in the sun, make up dance routines with her friends. Soon, she'd become a cheerleader at Eisenhower High. She was petite, made her a perfect flyer. Uh, each year in yearbook photos, her hair became blonder, her bangs more teased, hair sprayed higher and higher. For the early 90s, she was seen as quite the catch. Hot California cheerleader blonde. Uh, but she didn't let that go to her head, apparently. According to most, she was kind and generous, doing things like driving her friends to Taco Bell during lunch, uh, pitching in if they couldn't afford their gorditas or Mexican pizzas or whatever. She was faithful in addition to being a cheerleader, getting er up early to go to LDS classes before school. But by the time Lori was in high school, if not before, things started to get uh, a little weird in the Vallow home. Maybe this was where L Lori started to go off the rails mentally a bit. First, there was a lot of stress and anxiety in the Cox home over money. The Coxes stopped paying federal income taxes when Lori turned 15. Just, just didn't feel like they had the money. Just uh, stopped making the payments. Didn't make any payments at all in 1988, 89, 90. And they'd skip other years later on as well, quite a few years. And the federal government does not take too kindly to that. Not totally surprised that the Coxes stopped paying taxes. I mean, you may recall from the School of Profit Suck, episode 371, that there is more resistance to the demands of a secular government from within certain LDS circles than there are from the, the members of most other Abrahamic religious sects here in the States. Barry Cox, in addition to not paying taxes for three years, broke the law further when he made a false statement to the IRS about his taxes. And then after serving as his own attorney, rarely a good idea, he would serve jail time for this and have to pay some massive fines. Coxes could have lost everything. I wonder, Lori, uh, you know what she was hearing at home during her formative years about how unfair all of this was, how the government had no right to do what they did to the Cox family, how the laws of man were evil, not godly. They could have, they could have taken her swimming pool for fuck's sake. Then as a junior and senior, Lori dated Nelson Yanes, a popular, attractive boy. Going to get to more weirdness in a second in the Cox home. They were a beautiful couple, according to most who knew them. And the two ran off to Las Vegas to get married right after graduating, which Barry was not happy with. Lori's older brother, Alex, too, was married for a short time around this period uh, to a woman named Debbie. But then that relationship fell apart because of crazy dynamics, she would say, in the Cox family. And they, they are crazy. In 2020, De Debbie will tell police in Arizona, quote, there was a lot of inappropriate, there was a lot of inappropriate sexual touching and things going on in the family, particularly between Alex and his sister, Lori. Uh, Debbie said they simulated sex acts, read a police report. Alex would pick up Lori and she would wrap her legs around his waist. Alex would bounce Lori up and down on himself. This was done in front of Debbie. And he would often refer to his sister as hot. The officer wrote, Debbie did not think Alex was sleeping with Lori, but he had the liberty to touch her. Touch her? Touch her how? Fondle her breasts, put his hands up her skirt. What the fuck exactly was going on between these two? Right, they're doing this as young adults, not little kids who don't understand, you know, what they're doing. Uh, what else might have been going on between other members of the family? Uh, was Barry sexually abusing his kids, or was this just specifically an Alex and Lori weird thing? And going forward, their relationship will get so fucking strange. Before I, I even knew about Debbie's report, when I watched a not, uh, Netflix docu series about all this called "Sins of Our Mother," it came out in September of 2022. I wondered if Alex and Lori had some sort of incestuous relationship. Just the energy between them did not feel at all to me like normal sibling energy. I am purely speculating. But if I had to bet one way or the other, I would bet that they did 
fuck from time to time or at least engaged in some heavy petty, some hard dry humping. Uh, Lori's first marriage didn't last long, less than a year. Wonder if Nelson was troubled by uh, Lori's closeness with Alex as well. Barry then helped his daughter start a new life, buying her a Honda CRX, helping set her up with a place to live in Austin, Texas, where she would then become a hairdresser. Now let's change focus for a bit and meet the fucking psychopath who will later become Lori's fifth husband and a real world destroyer. March 9th, 1990, that day, 21-year-old Chad Daybell marries 19-year-old Tamara Tammy Douglas. Chad was originally from Springville, Utah, growing up on an avenue of brick homes with well-tended gardens and American flags proudly flying out front. Springville, 50 miles south of Salt Lake City, uh, just south of Provo. Around 80% of the residents at this time were LDS. Both of Chad's parents had attended Springville High. Jack was a member of the Future Farmers of America. Uh, and his younger girlfriend, Sheila Chestnut, uh, was a part of the Varsity Cheerleading Squad. Uh, the pair hastily married before Jack was drafted to fight in Vietnam in the mid-60s and left for a naval base in San Diego. Once Jack's naval service was over, the family returned to Springville, where he took a job at the nearby Geneva Steel Plant as an electrician, and Sheila gave birth to Chad and four more kids, Paul, Matt, Brad, and Rebecca. From a young age, Chad was fixated on death. It started when a third-grade classmate of his died suddenly and violently when a cave he was exploring collapsed and crushed him. Fourth grade, he wrote a little kid novella, Uh, titled The Murder of Dr. J and His Assistant. His teachers would praise his creativity. In middle school, Chad nearly shot his brother Matt to death on a hunting trip when they were trying to rustle up some pheasants. In fact, he did pull the trigger while the gun was apparently pointed at Matt, but no round fired. Chad and his family would go on to think this was a divine miracle. Uh, You know, Matt's life was spared by God. Uh, No miracle would come to stop Chad being bullied in middle school, though. Mad at the world after being picked on, he apparently made a habit of killing bees on his walk home. Uh, the bullies would pick on Chad, and then Chad would, you know, kill the bees. <laughs> okay? And one time while killing bees, he claimed he first heard the voice. Yep. He would later write about the voice extensively, how it scolded him, counseled him, reminded him when he went astray. Sometimes it gave him directions. Sometimes it gave him militaristic commands. And he said he never disobeyed the voice. So what was this? Was this mental illness? Religious belief? Something akin to an imaginary friend? Just a a nice way to uh, avoid taking responsibility for your own actions. Uh, The the voice made me do it. At the age of 14, Chad would receive a patriarchal patriarchal blessing, a rite administered to baptized members of the LDS church. The blessing declares their lineage, gives them personalized instructions from God. Despite this blessing being considered very private, Chad would describe it in his memoirs. He said it provided needed guidance at a time when he felt dejected, depressed, obsessed with Billy Joel so only the good die young believing that maybe his life on this earth would be short. He wrote that the blessing made it clear I had a long, wonderful life ahead of me. He would serve a mission, attend college, marry a wonderful woman, have children, and enjoy spiritual gifts that would be made known to me in later life that I would cultivate to bless the lives of others. Some of those gifts would manifest in just three years. On a warm day in 1985, when Chad was 17, he stood on the edge of a 60-foot-tall cliff at Flaming Gorge Reservoir in northeastern Utah, about to take a leap that he later would say changed the trajectory of his life. At the exact second his feet left the earth and his body dropped toward the water, he wrote about how it was as if a door opened below him and he fell right through it into another place, into another dimension. And he wasn't even high when this happened. When he hit the water, he wrote, it felt like I had slammed into concrete. A shock went through my entire body and I saw a flash of white light. I felt an audible pop at the base of my skull and thought, oh no, I broke my neck. At the top of his skull, he claimed he could now feel his spirit starting to exit his body, spilling out through the crown of his head. But then luckily, it got uh, snagged on some of his skull. His spirit did in the process (laughs) of leaving his body. It's like a a bubble or something, like a a sack. And it got snagged on some skull. I thought, ah, it sucks, you know. Ah, I hate it when your spirit gets snagged on something. Most most of the time, I hate it. I'm going to tell you, though, one, one day when my spirit got snagged, it saved my ass. I was 19 or 20 in a bathroom and I was throwing up so much from a case of alcohol poisoning. And I almost, I almost puked out my spirit. But thank the Lord, it got snagged on a piece of ham and cheese hot pocket that I just uh, tried to eat a few minutes earlier and I didn't properly chew. And a big chunk of ham and cheese and some bread got stuck in my throat when I was puking, which was scary. But then my spirit got snagged on that ball of hot pocket and it was a fucking miracle. (laughs) And minutes later, 
Minutes later, I started shitting my brains out. And another chunk of barely digested Hot Pocket got stuck in my butthole. And my spirit got snagged on that too. And it tried to exit me from the other hole. Twice that partially digested Hot Pocket saved my soul that night. And doctors say Hot Pockets are bad for you. Sometimes, sometimes they can save your soul. Anyway, enough about my spiritual true story snaggings. Let's talk more about Chad's true story snag. Due to his spirit... (laughs) Getting snagged. It's such a fucking dumb concept. Dude, his spirit getting snagged. (laughs) It was unable to fully detach from his skull, okay? But most of it had already come out of his head. And all of this allowed him to be alive in this physical world dimension, but also, because, you know, most of his spirit is out, be able to see into the rest of the spirit world. As the outer world mostly fell away from him, a new one around him was mostly opening like a giant eye waking from sleep, and he was its pupil, he would say. This was the other side of the veil, he wrote, where Chad saw an endless white plain spreading in all directions as warmth and music filled the air. Oh, man. I wonder if that music was was mostly harps. If it was mostly harps, then this might have been a heavenly vision. But if there was some percussion, well, then he was, ho oh, he was led astray, right? We learned all about how bad drums are in the Duggar suck. Not today, Satan! Did you know that Logan Keith plays the, the drums a lot. <laughs> yeah, a lot. It's fucked up. Part of the reason, I haven't told him yet, but it's part of the reason he's a 4.3 level uh, dark uh, fucking zombie devil entity right now. It is, let me take a second to talk about this. It is honestly amazing that I'm able to keep these podcasts coming out every week with all the fucking zombies I have to deal with constantly. Lindsay, 5.1 level dark zombie. Powerful. Not submissive at fucking all witch. Kyler, my son, level two dark zombie, which actually is kind of a fun energy to be around. Monroe, 4.3 level dark zombie. Lindsay's little witch protege. The two of them together are unbearable. Penny and Gigi, my dogs. Penny's a level 4.3 dark fucking wizard zombie dog who won't listen, who will not submit to my authority. She's a fluffy little zombie brat who does what she pleases. And Gigi, Ginger Bell, little Dee Dee Dumdrop, Level three, light worker. She is the best. Uh, but I fear Penny will destroy her because in addition to being sweet, she is very dumb. Tyler here, Tyler C, pfft, level 4.1 light worker. However, he does have pretty dark skin. Does that mean he's more susceptible to turning into a dark zombie? It is something I constantly worry about. <laughs> I'm clearly a level six light worker. I had to stay fucking, I had to stay so powerful. To rise above all the zombie negativity around me. Anyway, before Chad could see anyone of the celestial dimension, a friend swam out and pulled him to safety. And somehow him getting pulled to safety, I guess maybe his friend like stuffed his uh, spirit back in his uh, skull or something. Then over the next week, he said his right eye would occasionally go blind. Whoa. He believed that was a sign that the experience he'd had, uh, that he'd literally fallen through to another dimension and seen stuff the rest of us can't see, had been real. I was thinking the same thing. His eye paid the price or something. Who the fuck knows what really happened? He probably hit the water hard enough to give himself a concussion. Lost consciousness for a few moments, had some weird dreams, jumbled his brain up, loosened up some wiring. Uh, Maybe the wiring was connected to his eye or something. Uh, Chad believed he had an NDE. He had a NDE, a near-death experience. Then despite his powerfully spiritual near-death experience, life as usual resumed for Chad. He made good grades at Springville High, played baseball, I was in the National Honor Society, served on the student council as treasurer, won a scholarship to BYU where he planned to study journalism. He loved music, especially the Smiths. Uh, Didn't see that coming. I also love the Smiths. Their 1986 album, The Queen is Dead, considered by some prominent music critics to be one of the best, if not the best album of all time, actually. Uh, Chad made friends easily, but was unlucky romantically because he was a fucking dork. He's been described by some uh, sources as being a, quote, chubby dork. During his first year at BYU, Mormon girls he went on dates with, conservative Mormon girls, told him that he was too sheltered. One girl told him there's more to life than Utah Valley. Perhaps because of this sentiment, Chad decided to file paperwork to serve his mission early. He got accepted and he left school after a year. By the time he embarked on his Mormon mission, Chad claims he had read the Bible front to back nine times and the Book of Mormon 18 times. (laughs) My God. Most kids, they read the Book of Mormon once, maybe the Bible. His brother Pre- uh, Brad Daybell said later, you could ask him anything and he would know the answer. How many times have we seen this with cult leaders before? 
right? Most of them become scholars of the religion their, their cult spawns out of, kind of like David Koresh, right? Koresh had the Bible virtually memorized by the time he was 18. Doing shit like that goes a long ways to legitimize these quacks, right? They must be speaking the truth because they're so familiar with scripture. Chad took crash courses in Spanish, then embarked on a two-year mission in New Jersey. Not the destination I was expecting to hear about following the two years in Spanish. Uh, Chad will say it was an enlightening experience and one that told him he wanted nothing to do with big city life. Wish I knew how much he was harassed on that mission. I'm guessing so much. After New Jersey, he came back home to Springville and BYU and, and now set out on a new mission of finding a wife. One day, he flipped to his younger brother's Springville High yearbook, noticed a girl in a white V-neck dress with a thin gold chain around her neck, her light hair cut into a pixie-like Winona Ryder or Jamie Lee Curtis haircut. Her name was uh, Tammy Douglas. I love that he went to his fucking brother's high school yearbook, right? Clearly the college girls still not interested in this fucking dork. So he's like, well, maybe I can fucking talk a high school girl into going out with me. Uh, at a singles night held at a local uh, LDS get together, Chad noticed Tammy across the gym on the other side of the volleyball net. I'm going to spike it in your face. She playfully told him she was flirting and he liked it. At Springville High, Tammy was a high achiever as well. A member of the National Honor Society, the band, the Spanish club, the yearbook staff. After Chad had returned home from his mission, he had taken a job digging graves in a cemetery managed by the local parks department. He did graves for about two years, and then two of his younger brothers would go on to uh, also get uh, grave digging jobs. Is that where he started to think about zombies when he was a grave digger? The novelty of this job was not lost on the inspiring writer in Chad, who made it the subject of his first memoir, One Foot in the Grave. Published in 2001, the book is presented as something of a, a how-to guide to getting along with the person digging a grave for your loved one. Very, uh, very specific niche. While Chad was digging graves, Tammy, it turned out, also worked for the Parks Department as a secretary, not a fellow grave digger. After their encounter with the volleyball game, she started hand-delivering burial reports to the graveyard, hoping to run into the sweet grave-digging little uh, guy she now had a crush on. I mean, what girl doesn't love a sweet cemetery dweller? Uh, they soon started talking, then dating, then they were engaged the day before Thanksgiving 1989. They'll be married at the Mantai Temple, an hour and a half away in the mountains. Meanwhile, while finishing up his degree at BYU, Chad gets some stories about death and religion, and very little else, published by The Universe, the BYU student newspaper. After graduating, he considers applying for grad school at Utah State University, but The Voice returns and tells him not to. Uh, he said The Voice told him, quote, You won't need additional schooling to accomplish your life's mission." Is he paving a path to avoid taking responsibility for horrible actions with this voice shit? Right? Like I said earlier, I, I didn't do it. Uh, the, the voice, I didn't want to. The voice made me. You know, I, I had to listen to the voice. Denying the voice would be like Abraham denying the commandments of God. It feels like in my gut, that's what he's doing here. Tammy gave birth to the couple's oldest son, Garth, in 1992. And by the following year, Chad is now working as a copy editor at the Ogden Standard Examiner. Then in 1993, while on vacation, Chad would claim the voice... Uh, told him to go into the thrashing ocean and cling to a rock, <laughs> which, which he did. Immersed in salt water, barely hanging on to consciousness, Chad said he now experienced his second NDE, one that sure seemed highly avoidable. And his first true religious vision, he would say, two men appeared in his personal revelation, two pioneering Utah ancestors. And they asked if Chad would complete a series of tasks. And righteous and obedient Chad said, of course, yes, yes, of course I will. Then he came back into his body, stumbled towards the shore, and his wife now rushed this idiotic, delusional drama queen to the hospital. Going forward, Chad will now claim he can see glimpses of the future, like his son getting hit by a car in the Kmart parking lot, which was avoided by Chad telling his wife, and then she didn't take him to Kmart that day or some shit. You know, probably would have never happened. Even if it would have happened, pretty sure, uh, you know, I was almost hit by a car in Kmart parking lot once. Pretty sure almost every kid who has been taken to big parking lots as a toddler uh, a fair amount of times has been almost hit by a car. A lot of Chad's glimpses have been focused on death. And now let's catch up with Lori. When we last left Lori, her first marriage had just ended and she was living in Austin, Texas, working as a hairdresser. In October of 1995, still living there, the 22-year-old will briefly marry again to William Lagioa in Austin. According to court records, the pair had begun dating shortly after she moved there from California. At the wedding, she was around three months pregnant. We weren't in favor of him, Janice Cox, her mom, will later tell 2020. A few months after the wedding, things were already falling apart. Little is known about La Gioa, but in the criminal complaint Lori later filed, she said her husband was manipulative, deceitful, and drunk all the time. 
She alleged she had been physically abusive to her during the entirety of their relationship, and during her pregnancy, he had threatened to snap my neck and kill the baby if I ever called the police again to have him arrested. Her biggest mistake, she said, was initially forgiving all of Lagio's sins. If, if he did any of that, she is so full of shit. As we'll see, I have uh, doubts about basically all of her claims. On April 8th, 1996, she gave birth to a boy who she named Colby Jordan on hospital forms. Um, sorry, some sources say October uh, 8th. Some sources say April 8th, 1996. A uh, little, little tough to confirm Colby's uh, birth date. 1996 seems to be the agreed upon year. On hospital forms, Lori did not list anyone as the boy's father. She was still kind of seeing uh, Lagioa, who's believed to be Colby's biological dad, but he hadn't converted to the LDS church yet, which greatly annoyed her. She uh, would write, I prayed that he would accept my religion, repent of his carnal, selfish, and sensual behavior, and become a Christian. The marriage uh, crumbled soon after Colby's birth, over before it ever really started. This all came at a, at a tough time for the Cox family. Lori's parents were still fighting the IRS. Also, her older brother, Alex, possible fuck buddy, possible brother with benefits. Is that too fucked up of a term for him? Uh, had become excommunicated from the LDS church over sexual promiscuity. And her sister, Stacy, also getting a divorce. Interestingly, in that divorce, her husband, Steve Cope, would write about the family. Like Alex's ex-wife, he would write about the Cox's dysfunction. Uh, Cope wrote in a court document seeking temporary custody of his daughter, her family was a psychological hornet's nest. He references Stacy had stated that her father suffered from some sort of undiagnosed mental ailment and that her mother, quote, is obsessed with issues of weight, physical appearance, and feminine bodies. I do not want Melanie, that was his daughter, to be exposed further to them. What was going on in this family? Uh, once, as described during the lengthy divorce and custody proceedings between Steve and Stacy Cope, Barry Cox showed up at the Home Depot where Cope worked and proceeded to shove him up against the wall by his neck and started yelling about Mormon scripture. Uh, Barry Harry Cox also then stuffed marriage disillusion papers down Steve's shirt before someone watching called 911 and he left. All of this seems to have had a, a terrible effect on Stacy's mental health or maybe her childhood had already, you know, pretty messed her up pretty bad. Steve couldn't figure it out, uh, but he felt it was clear something bad was going to happen to her and that her family would have a role in that. By the spring of 95, Steve Cope was worried that his wife was trying to kill herself. She once spoke to her parents on the phone and then told him, quote, and we agree it's my time to go. Fucking what? <laughs> Talking to your parents about like, hey, I'm feeling like I should uh, maybe off myself. They're like, we were thinking the same thing. Uh, she then wondered how loud, how or wondered out loud how much insulin she'd have to take to slip into a coma and die. Ultimately, Steve will get full custody of his daughter. Uh, what he will never get, he'll later state, is an understanding of exactly what the fuck was going on in his ex-wife's family, but something bad. In the spring of 1998, Barry Harry Cox, Janice Cox, Lori and her son Colby, as well as her younger sister Summer, went on a vacation in Hawaii, as the family had done several times previously. This time would not nearly be uh, would not be nearly as relaxing as previous trips. Shortly after they arrived, they received a phone call from Lori's oldest brother, Alex, loves his sister the wrong way, Cox. Uh, he said he had gone to his parents' house to check on Stacy and found her unconscious. Or, based on what Alex will get up to uh, later, uh, maybe Alex was the reason. She was unconscious. Maybe he uh, killed his sister. Stacy was rushed to the hospital. Her ex-husband Steve and daughter Melanie rushed to be with her, but Stacy uh, would never wake up and would die at the age of 31. Later, Steve will tell police that Alex had taken Stacy's credit cards shortly before her death and racked up $17,000 in unpaid charges. Uh, strange and very suspicious. Extremely suspicious, considering who he becomes later. And he may have already been that guy now. Uh, 25-year-old Lori, meanwhile, still in Texas, navigating life as a single mom. She's still working as a hairdresser. She's moved to San Antonio now, where her parents also just moved. One of Lori's regulars was a 43-year-old former Navy man named Joseph Ryan. The two hit it off, and he agreed to convert to Mormonism for her. In 2001, 28-year-old Lori and Joe get married on a beach in Maui, husband number three. The next year, they welcome a baby girl, Tylee Ashlyn Ryan. And now let's check back in with Chad. By 2003, Chad and Tammy Daybell had made publishing their family business. The couple co-wrote a series of four children's books called Tiny Talks, uh, discussing temples, the Savior, the Church of Jesus Christ, and the family for elementary school age readers. The books were published by Cedar Fort, a popular Utah publisher of predominantly LDS literature 
where Chad worked from 2001 to 2004 as a managing editor. The Daybells books were sold in LDS bookstores, including Deseret Book. Uh, Chad's own first novel, An Errand for Emma, became such a bestseller, at least regionally, that he and his family hit the road for a promotional tour of readings and uh, book signings throughout Utah and Southern Idaho. Things were going really well for Chad until 2003, when his writing landed him in some hot water with the church. In his new book, Chasing Paradise, published by an imprint of Cedar Fort, a warrior angel dropkicks somebody through a wall. And then that scene was deemed too irreverent for Deseret Book's taste. A store's book buyer declined to order the book upon discovering this very violent scene. When Chad found out Chasing Paradise uh, would not be placed on shelves at Deseret Book, he was fucking irate. He considered himself a super Mormon, more devout, more committed than most. He took the news hard, very hard, believing he'd been singled out, was being persecuted, instead of just accepting that someone subjectively decided his book was tonally off for an LDS bookstore. Chad said in an interview at the time, is this the new standard? No swearing, no sex, and now no conflict? Then Chad received some tougher feedback about his book. An executive at Desiree Books said that Chad's novel, uh, it wasn't about the dropkick. It was, it was simply just not of high enough quality to be sold there, right? So it wasn't about violence. It was about uh, they thought his book sucked. <laughs> Creative work, man. It's tough that way. I get it. I've had many a project get shot down over the years because various execs just didn't think it was uh, very good. In response to the rejection, in 2004, the Daybells founded Spring Creek Book Company, a publishing imprint of their own. One that gave Chad, you know, the artistic freedom to write whatever he wanted without editorial oversight and to contact other authors, especially ones who had also had near-death experiences complete with religious visions, in particular, apocalyptic visions of the future. And a lot of this kind of author did exist at this time. A new wave of several Mormon writers had been claiming since the late 90s, uh, not just to have visited the spirit world, but to have had visions of the imminent collapse of the United States in particular. In 1999, an author named Gail Smith wrote of her visions of economic collapse and earthquakes along the Wasatch Front. Don't remember that happening. While other visionaries had described the breakdown of social ties, historian Christopher Blythe says, Smith's vision was set apart by its portrayal of violence, cannibalism, and rape occurring in the Mormon homeland. Not pulling punches in her vision. In this chaotic future, she believed the federal government would declare martial law in Utah. There would be a roundup of guns, destruction of food stores, and a ban on prayer. Anyone who resisted would be killed or put into a camp. There would be a plague and a nuclear attack. Russia and China would invade the U.S. And then a bunch of people would get uh, raped and, and eaten and stuff, and, and heads would be put on sticks, and fucking old ladies would get kicked down the street, and uh, dogs would rape cats, and whatever was gonna, evil was going to happen. It was going to happen to a lot of people. Sarah Menant, another popular NDA personality, wrote of similar calamities in her 2002 book, There Is No Death. She saw a coming apocalypse of bioterrorism, rioting, Mad Max-style gangs roaming the U.S. in search of new victims to fucking eat and uh, tape their eyeballs to their foreheads or some shit. Families would turn on each other. Men would kill their wives and children for food and water. Mothers would kill their children, Menant foresaw. And she, too, gained a large following, right? Because fear fucking sells. Not quite as good as sex, but close. And this was the kind of shit that Chad was interested in. And now we check back within with the, uh, with the Coxes. What, what are these Cox up to? By May 2004, Barry and Janice Cox. I, I, <laughs> I, wish their, I wish their last name was Cox. Like instead of Cox, why can't one family just be named C-O-C-K? The Cox. Uh, Barry and Janice were having more tax trouble. They owed more than $300,000 in back taxes now. Because they, they just kept not paying federal taxes because they're fucking idiots. And they had no intention of paying this, mo- paying this money back. They just kept filing motions claiming that the federal government did not have a right to take their money and then didn't have a right to take their property in order to pay the debts that they now had because they didn't pay taxes. And the government strongly disagreed. It turns out paying taxes is, you know, not really optional. Also turns out that if you keep refusing to pay, the government can and will fuck your life up quite a bit. Uh, the Coxes had taken their, uh, had their home, excuse me, taken from them over this. They were forced off of their property. Their house was sold. The sale of the house only shaved off $114,000 of the taxes they owed. So now they have no house and they still owe around $200,000. Barry Cox now sues the U.S. Department of the Treasury. He wrote in a complaint, Barry L. Cox is a natural born citizen of the United States. The evidence proving the IRS is a fraud. A lot of capital letters. Is compelling and sufficient. IRS malfeasance is rampant and partially responsible for the Tea Party movement. 
the collection of federal income tax is a sham. And look, I get the sentiment. I fucking hate the existence of the IRS. I truly do. Uh, I think that oftentimes they behave more like an organized crime syndicate than a needed tool of a just government. And I wish, right, if we're not going to provide citizens with free health care, maternal and paternal uh, paid leave, or paternity leave, you know, maternity leave, a free daycare, free college educations. If our income taxes are not going to go to a government that actually takes care of its citizens, then I wish we could figure out how to have a government funded only by property sales, import, export, vice taxes, luxury, payroll, capital gains, taxes, etc. But that's not reality. And I know the federal government would fucking destroy me if I stopped paying income taxes. So, you know, I pay them. Barry didn't feel the same way. Uh, Barry was, much like his daughter, will be uh, delusional. Someone who thought that the laws did not apply to them because, you know, they're special, I guess. Also in 2004, Lori Cox, now 30 years old, uh, has changed her name to Lori Ryan, adopting the surname of her third husband. Uh, She also appeared on Wheel of Fortune. I wonder if Pat Sajak did anything to her. Right, We've talked about that motherfucker's dirty, dirty, dirty deeds here before. Dirty, dirty deeds I completely made up years ago. Uh, Lori did pretty well on the show. She introduced, uh, was introduced as Lori Ryan from Austin, Texas, a hairstylist in Austin. And she said, I have a wonderful husband, Joseph, at home, who is watching our two beautiful children, Colby, who is seven, and Tylee, who is one. And she takes second place and win $70,500. And she also felt like God wanted her to win on the Wheel of Fortune. Totally. Right? That, that feels like the kind of shit that God worries about. Game shows. Lori already starting to weird out her also very religious siblings and friends with an increasing amount of talk about her special relationship with God. Everything she does, everything that happens is a sign of this or that proof that God has some kind of special plan for her. That same year, she also competed in the Mrs. Texas beauty pageant as Mrs. Hayes County because God wanted her to show off them titties. Come on. The devil wants you to keep them hid. The Lord wants them to see the light. Show off those titties. Uh, she would show off her toned, curvy body in a teal bikini and silver high heels, as the Lord wish. To me, it feels a little satanic, a little zombie influenced, right? Feels like uh, she wanted a lot of guys who were not her husband to fantasize about how fun it would be to ride her hot little used bike down the hill and off some ramps. Uh, by this time, the Ryan family had created a life of luxury for themselves, lived in a custom 4,500 square foot house. That's a big house with a curving staircase, long driveway, man-made pond in the backyard. But her husband, Joe, was maybe a terrible dude, but probably not. But maybe. His sister once saw him drag Colby upstairs and uh, uh, beat him with something, uh, apparently. But, you know, by something, I think she just heard some some, uh, discipline. In an interview in 2020, Colby would confirm this and say that Joe Ryan also sexually abused him. But we will later see that that claim may, if not likely, fabricated. August of 2004, Lori files for divorce and a fierce battle follows. During one recess at the courthouse in Travis County, Texas, Lori claims that Joe Ryan hit her and then he was arrested for assault. But would he be found guilty? No, he would not. Investigators starting to doubt how truthful Lori is about, well, fucking anything. Investigators who worked on the case noted that it appeared Lori engaged in a pattern of taking her children from professional to professional in an effort to, quote, get a statement, right? Get the statement that she wanted. There were a lot of indications that her children had been coached by her about their story of sexual abuse. So Colby, maybe not sexually abused. Lori will definitely reveal, re, uh, excuse me, reveal herself uh, later to be wildly manipulative. This investigation will also expose how batshit crazy Lori is becoming. Her religious beliefs continue to become more radical. By 2007, Lori uh, had told one examiner that she fully believed that her daughter Tylee was the reincarnated spirit of her deceased sister, Stacy Cope. The advocate noted her belief system is riddled with ghosts and seemingly fanatical religious dogma. Court experts concluded during a 2007 jury trial that Joe Ryan, not a danger to his daughter, and split custody was arranged. And that would not have happened if the court determined that Joe was some violent pedophile. Not saying for sure he wasn't. I certainly wasn't there during all of this. I just, again, do not fucking trust the claims of Lori or even of anyone heavenly influenced by Lori, like uh, her son Colby. August 5th, 2007, Joe Ryan sees his four-year-old daughter for the first supervised visit in a year at a facility in Austin because Lori was making it real hard for him to have these visits. After the visit with Tylee, he was told to wait for 15 minutes before going outside, a precaution instituted for all parents to allow the children to leave safely without any threat of an incident. In the waiting room, Ryan struck up a casual conversation with the woman. 
Afterward, Ryan walked outside to the parking lot, was putting things into his car when a man dressed head to toe in dark clothing approached him and said, I'm Alex. We need to talk. And then immediately this Alex guy fires a taser into Joe's chest. Joe collapses to the ground, fracturing his wrist. And, and as Joe screams, Alex calmly walks away. This Alex, of course, is Lori's brother. Old Bubba Dry Humps. Maybe Bubba Wet Humps. OG Jamie Lannister. If you get that reference. Uh, Bubba Humps will be sentenced to 90 days in jail. Later, Alex will tell his side of the story uh, from the stage at a comedy club in Glendale, Arizona. Uh, during a stand-up set, he performed on a Saturday night. Yeah, he's dabbling in stand-up now. Mostly open mic shit. You ever had something you knew was the right thing to do, but it turns out that later on, it was a felony? Cox asked the crowd, which erupted in laughter. This is a true story. I found out my ex-brother-in-law was a pedophile, so I took a stun gun and I discharged it right in his nutsack. I did. I mean, you hit him in his chest, but you know, whatever. A little embellishment for comedy. The audience kept laughing. Uh, he apparently did not share any material about dry humping his sister in front of his ex-wife. It's harder to sell jokes about that premise. Uh, from jail, Alex wrote his friend Mary Tracy a letter telling him about his life in jail. He asked her for a favor. He said he wanted her to call his mom. Ask her to put Joe's address on a postcard and his license plate number. I think it will be popular in here, he said. Trying to get some fellow inmates to do something to Joe, who he is telling is a pedophile uh, when these guys get out. In another letter, he asked Tracy for a picture of Joe Ryan, saying some of the guys would like to hang out with him. Years later, one woman would tell uh, police that Lori asked her brother to attack Joe once he got out, attack him a lot more aggressively. This woman said that Lori, quote, had told me that she hired her brother to kill Joe because of stuff he did to her children. Joe was going to die for what he did. People don't get away from stuff like that. But did he even do anything? I don't think he probably did. Adam Cox, Lori and Alex's brother, told a similar story to the police saying Lori and Alex planned Joe's death. And Lori found out, at, uh, and Lori found out Joe molested her kids supposedly and Alex got upset and Al said I'll take care of him they planned out how they were going to kill Joe Al was going to taser him throw him in the trunk and take him out to a field and shoot him and then bury him there's something wrong about Lori and Alex he told the police I find Adam's take here interesting how he adds the word supposedly to you know Lori finding out Joe molested the kids seems like he didn't take Lori at her word and he makes it clear that he thinks something is wrong with both Lori and Alex. How long did he think that? Did he start to think that uh, back when they were all kids and Lori and Alex were doing weird sexual shit? Also, by the time this is all happening, Lori is already remarried again. Really seems to not be too worried about how many miles she's putting on her bike. Oh, but the bike reference is confusing. It comes from the Duggar family episode. Patriarch Jim Bob, very worried about his daughter's bikes, aka bodies, being ridden by more than one dude. Because, you know, a woman's worth is based almost entirely in her lifetime number of dicks. That, you know, that makes sense. Uh, February 24th, 2006, Lori had gotten married to Charles Vallow in Las Vegas, husband number four. He was a 49-year-old financial planner. She was a 32-year-old gold-digging wackadoodle brother fucking psychopath or something. I'm not totally sure what she was at this point in the story other than an insane person who has now been married four times by the age of 32. Vallow was a former college baseball player. He had big muscles and a big truck, liked to live a big wealthy lifestyle. Lori was, according to some sources, a trophy wife of his, who mostly wanted to make trips to Hawaii when she pleased. And they were what each other wanted, apparently. Or at least thought they were at first. Charles converted to Mormonism to placate his new wife. Both had children from previous marriages. Lori had Colby and Tylee, and Charles had two boys. Uh, they've asked in some articles, uh, I've, I've read to have their names, uh, real names not used. So I'll respect that wish here as well. Both Charles and Lori were locked into a custody battle with their former spouses. Interestingly, Charles' ex-wife, Cheryl Wheeler, would tell the court that Charles would often mix drugs and alcohol and become unstable. And she would later recognize a similar instability in Charles' new wife. Also, court records show that in 2007, Wheeler filed an affidavit in support of extraordinary relief in Travis County, Texas, in which she alleged her sons were being subjected to inappropriate sexual behavior in the Vallow household. Wheeler said that she found a provocative photo of her son's new stepsister, four-year-old Tylee, on their cell phones. But what the fuck is that? Some random or some pattern continuing here from Lori's own upbringing? What is with his family, right? And healthy sexual boundaries. Uh, Wheeler also said she became concerned after her son said that their father and stepmother, uh, stepmother would regularly give them NyQuil or prescription sleeping pills and that they witnessed excessive fighting between Lori and their dad. As a result, cameras were installed in the house to monitor the children. Uh, they would never 
turn up anything alarming or capture anything alarming though. After they married, Charles and Lori moved to Arizona and Lori's ex, Jill Ryan, relocated as well in order to continue to be able to see his daughter, Tylee. Lori, however, believed he was simply trying to torment her by moving to Arizona. Uh, so what the fuck is old chatty doomsday daddy up to around now? Nothing too exciting, actually. Still married, still writing, but his writing is getting pretty weird. Around late 2007, Chad Daybell began rolling out his first multi-part fictional series called Standing in Holy Places, based on his personal revelations and visions. Now, previously, he had said his stories were meant to be taken as fictional, nothing more. But now the line between what was a Daybell fictional story and what was Daybell prophetic vision begins to blur. It soon becomes clear that his fictional books serve as a window into a lot of very real things like his belief system, goals, priorities, and aspirations. By the mid-2000s, Chad had evolved far beyond where he'd started with Tiny Talks books, uh, those ones that he and Tammy co-authored for kids years prior. On the covers of many of his paperbacks, his name runs across the top now in large, white, serif letters, uh, a styling typically reserved for best-selling authors, reflecting his intention to be ranked among the literary heavyweights, right? Tom Clancy, John Grisham, Stephen King, and Chad Daybell. Often, though not always, Chad's books begin with an apology. He'll uh, talk about how he knows he's not a great writer, and instead of trying to hide the truth, he confronts it head on. He explains that his writing style, which is filled admittedly with cliches, plot holes, and thin characters, could be better. But by his explanation, the actual craft of his stories is simply a barrier, something readers need to glide past. In the end, it's his powerful ideas, the concepts that matter. It's, it's the message, not the stories themselves, which is a weird way to try and rationalize being a fucking terrible author. Uh, despite his preface, it was still hard. For a lot of readers to overlook shit like his character's odd choices or how he consistently negatively uh, negatively portrayed women. In one book, a character's wife is missing and he suspects that she is dead, buried in a funeral pyre outside a hospital. However, he does not mourn the loss. Doesn't even look for her. <laughs> he simply shrugs, decides, yeah, she's probably dead, and just uh, leaves to go join a group of strangers at a survivalist camp. Very similar to how Chad will later casually shrug off the death of his own wife. In another book, the protagonists are a young Mormon missionary named Nathan Foster and his pretty girlfriend, Marie Shaw, two Latter-day Saints who are facing the same daily challenges you are. They and their family members might remind you of people in your ward or neighborhood, Chad explains. The book opens with Foster miraculously saving a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles from a bombing, a scene that goes largely without explanation for the rest of the four-book series. But it does set up Nathan Foster as a brave and manly hero. Women in his stories never heroes, but are often villains. For example, Marie Shaw is introduced to the reader as a member of the LDS church and a friend of Nathan Foster's, but also a determined young professional eager to land an internship at a public relations firm in Chicago, far from the safety of her lifelong home in the Salt Lake, uh, Salt Lake Valley. Her father fears his daughter's worldliness. Her ambition is portrayed as a red flag, a sign she has been corrupted. Indeed, the women in Chad Daybell's new books are flat, lifeless, and foolish. They're complainers, questioners, whiners. They're physically weak and often killed. His male characters, on the other hand, are like a, like a Mormon James Bond type. You know, they're strong, they save women. At least when these women aren't killed, they do. And most importantly, they gather the elect to wait out the apocalypse in a place literally called the White Camps. Chad also clearly sees his books as being full of prophecies. And the author's note in his book, Evading Babylon, the first book in his later Times of Turmoil series, Chad makes an argument uh, for why someone might look beyond his clunky prose. In many ways, the global events described in the Great Gathering have already begun. The other key moments are fast approaching. The United States' economic situation has grown markedly worse since I wrote that book in 2006, and now I'm able to add many details that have emerged since that time. He would reiterate that many of his predictions had come true, and with each book that came out, he seemed less and less interested in labeling it as fiction. It was like he believed his books were prophecies. And uh, like he believed that Chad was Nathan Foster. In the third book in the Times of Turmoil series, Days of Fury, Foster, along with his various followers and now wife Marie, would make their way to the only safe place left for Latter-day Saints in the world, Rexburg, Idaho. Fuck yeah. Idaho, the most important place in the world, according to Chad Daybell. Uh, the Lord foresaw what was going to happen, an apostle tells Nathan and Marie, and the church has been, has been preparing Rexburg for several years to be the temporary headquarters of the church. It will become a wonderful city of light with thousands of saints living there until Missouri is fully cleansed and we can establish new Jerusalem. 
Nothing against Rexburg and Missouri, but uh, out of the whole world, those are the best parts. Uh, soon, at a, around 2014, Chad would start talking about his family moving uh, to Rexburg. He said the voice, the voice told him they had to fucking live there. Okay, guys. So now they're start looking for they're looking for houses. Uh, by March of 2015 in Rexburg. One afternoon, Chad strolled a property just north of town, not far from his brother Matt's house. Light-colored brick house sat on four quiet acres of nodding grassy pasture, a little duck pond in the back. Chad and his eldest, Garth, looked out across the field behind the house towards the peaks of the Grand Tetons, and it looked like their own personal Zion, and they knew they had found their home. Chad wasn't just also making physical moves around this time, he was making some virtual ones, moving into a new online community. Uh, Remember how I mentioned all those Mormons who had NDEs and visions? There was an internet-based home for them now. This uh, a website called Another Voice of Warning or LDS Avow. It's still there. It's an online forum run by a Mormon prepper living near Rexburg, filled with conspiracies, fake news, uh, entire sub forums dedicated to the elect, tent cities, uh, more silly, get the fuck out of here shit. In 2006, fringe Mormon Roger Young created Avow as his attempt to make, quote, a place where faithful saints can gather and discuss topics in a safe, loving environment without the worry of being attacked or ridiculed. For their beliefs. Yeah. Well, your beliefs deserve to be fucking ridiculed. Uh, Other sites he'd started had been swarmed with what he called wolves in sheep's clothing or people with good critical thinking skills. But with a vow, he had administrators ready to ferret these fuckers out from the start. He charged members $3 per month, hoping that would deter people who were just there to troll them. With the new site, a vow would also have a store run by Christopher Parrott of Rigby, Idaho, just south of Rexburg. When Aval started, the only book the store stocked was Sarah Mennett's NDE account, There Is No Death. And then for years, the store would also sell all of Chad Daybell's titles. He quickly became a big-time member, right? Big fish, small pond, well-known, popular, considered uh, highly learned. This site, again, still active today, now charges between $3.75 and $5 a month to join. Pretty reasonable. If you're looking for a new place to meet a lot of batshit crazy, paranoid, delusional, self-important wackadoodles. On this site, Chad would meet a woman, a so-called light worker named Julie Rowe. Once Chad and Julie got to talking, they both realized they had a lot in common. Both were fucking insane. Both were also LDS. Both claimed to have had uh, several near-death experiences. Both felt compelled to share those with the world, despite church authorities uh, cautioning them against doing so. Both felt burdened by what they couldn't say and wanted to free themselves from those constraints. Not only did Chad believe Rowe's experiences, he also believed he had seen her in a vision of his own. Chad said he had seen a tall, dark-haired woman in a full waking vision of her speaking to a large group. He offered to publish her story through his Spring Creek book company. The book, A Greater Tomorrow, would be full of terror-inducing predictions, moments of destruction, pestilence, famine, fire, despair, and it was a hit, at least amongst the people on a vow. Uh, Spring Creek hastily released a follow-up, Julia Rose's second book called The Time Is Now. And this book foretold of dragons slithering in the sky above Seattle. Not kidding. Literally fucking dragons <laughs> above Seattle for some reason. And how the biblical the biblical Cain uh, once approached her in the airport. Uh-huh. It's good, good stuff. Good, important stuff. Her second book sells just as well as the first. <laughs> and now Julie starts a podcast called Eyes Open. Uh-huh. You can still find some of the episodes online, at least on YouTube. And it is fucking hard to listen to. I tried. It's pretty bad. <laughs> it's very, very bad. All the episodes I saw are just uh, Lori recording herself on her phone in her car. <laughs> she acts like she's super important. So important, she had to flee to the wilderness three years ago. Uh, yeah, she was talking three years ago about how she had to hire a top-level security team to protect her, you know, from all the people who want to take her down because she's very important and famous. Uh, she acts like she's as famous as Taylor Swift or something. She has a little over 2,000 YouTube followers and almost no social media presence. (laughs) She was only kind of a big deal in in the very fringe echo chamber of Avow and I'm sure some similar websites. Anyway, by the fall of 2015, not long after Chad had moved to Rexburg, Julie Rowe would be reprimanded by the LDS church for her views. In September of 15, uh, the church announced that members should avoid being caught up in extreme efforts to anticipate catastrophic events. The writings and speculations of individual church members, some of which have gained currency recently looking at you, Jules, should be considered as personal accounts or positions that do not reflect church doctrine. 
Chad now became Rose's biggest online defender, chastising people for refusing to buy her books. He got his daughter, Emma Daybell, to narrate Rose's audiobook. Also used the controversy around what she was saying to begin a newsletter subscription service in which he sent emails interpreting global events through scripture. Then in May of 2016, Chad made a big prediction that the wake-up earthquake would happen by the fall and faithful saints answering the call would gather in four locations, which did not fucking happen if you remember 2016. Uh, one was in San Pete County, Utah, where the Manti Temple is located. Another was in Rexburg. That year, he wrote about Hurricane Harvey hitting Houston. We have also been told there will be great flooding via tsunamis and storms in various locations across the world as the days of tribulation unfold, he said. I have seen visions of future flooding through Utah and Idaho, and I know that water-related damage is going to be a main component of the cleansing of America. Chad got a ton of positive responses about this shit. Uh, Despite there not being a fucking snowball's chance in hell that Utah and Idaho are going to become heavily flooded anytime soon to some end times degree, right? The geography, if you just fucking look into the basic geography, it will not allow that. A lot of mountainous terrain covering much of both states, making a lot of flooding, like apocalyptic level flooding, literally impossible. Unless the world's ocean levels are about to rise by, you know, several thousand feet. That's one of the fun things about apocalyptic predictions. You don't have to make them even remotely plausible. Good old magical thinking will still likely attract at least a few dipshits, no matter how nonsensical your visions are. Uh, Let's back up a few years, 2014. Catch up again with Mrs. Uh, Brother Humper now. This year, Charles and Lori adopt a two-year-old boy as their own. Technically, he's Charles's great-nephew, the son of Charles's uh, nephew, who was troubled and unable to care for the boy, especially since he had special needs. Charles and Lori, looking like great parents at this point, swoop in to help. The boy is two pounds, 15 ounces, pretty tiny when he's born, May 25th, 2012, as uh, Kanane Trahan. Uh, but with Lori as his mother, he becomes Joshua Vallow or JJ. Any Anyone else think it's super fucking weird how she just decided to change a two-year-old's first name and Charles just went along with it? Not sure I've heard of that happening before in an adoption situation. Like, like I'm sure it has happened, but I can't think of another example off the top of my head. Uh, JJ was pretty far along on the autism spectrum. Also had a severe case of ADHD. Shortly before he died, most people were amazed how well Lori and Charles parented him. They were patient and loving. Tylee, too, was a wonderful big sister who became almost like another mother for him. After living in Arizona for six years, the Vallow family relocated to the Hawaiian island of Kauai, one of my favorite places on earth, uh, to live in a beautiful house near a golf course, not unlike the one Lori had grown up in. Tylee's father, Joe Ryan, opposed the move, concerned about the distance it would put between him and his daughter and the availability of quality medical care to treat Tylee's pancreatitis. But at Lori's urging, Tylee went anyway. Poor Ryan, right? Dude uprooted his life, moved to Arizona to be close to his daughter. Then her mom bounces again now to the most remote state in the nation. In Hawaii, the family threw themselves into their their local LDS ward and Lori taught Sunday school there. They also hired a live-in nanny since Charles uh, was gone most of the time away on business in California. For Lori, living in Kauai was nothing short of a dream. Something that combined her love of luxury with a belief in the end of days. Right, you see, she, like Chad, also thought the apocalypse was coming soon. But instead of Rexburg, she felt like Hawaii was probably going to be the best place to write it all out. Uh, She truly believed this. Talked about it a lot. Later, her son Colby told interviewers that she was always talking about the second coming. (laughs) To the point that Lori discouraged her children from making extensive plans for their futures. Like going to college. One of the many reasons why it is so fucking stupid To live as if you know the world's about to end. As I've said many times before, this mentality has worked out literally zero times. Billions of fucking people, I would imagine, over the course of human history have thought like, man, world's about to end, and it never ends, right? It's damaged countless lives, helped literally no one outside of assholes who sell a lot of books about how the world's ending soon or sell subscriptions to websites based on this belief, taking tithes based on this belief, etc., Right, The ones putting out the call that the world's about to end, sometimes they do very well. Those who heed the call get motherfucked time and time again. One of Lori's friends from Kauai would later tell police that she believed in the end of the world and everyone is going to die and she is preparing for it. (laughs) Once she recalled, Lori talked about driving off a cliff with her kids in the car. She said, Lori would say crazy stuff sometimes. 
but she didn't expect anything bad to happen. Uh, what? If one of my friends starts talking about how the world is for sure ending soon, like won't shut the fuck up about it, how we're all going to die, is discouraging her kids from going to college, making future plans, and then mentions, you know, we'd probably just drive off a cliff together. I am reporting her crazy ass. Hawaii, however, uh, not destined to be the paradise where the Valos would ride out the apocalypse. Wasn't working out for JJ. Family would ultimately move back to Arizona because he needed better educational resources to help with his autism. I strongly assume that Charles was pushing for this move and not Lori. In Gilbert, a suburb of Phoenix, the family picks up life as usual with the occasional lunch with Barry and Janice Cox, who uh, now live nearby in Santan Valley. And uh, there was also visits from Lori's fuck buddy. I mean, a brother, a.k.a. Alex, a.k.a. Bubba Humps, and her sister Summer. Uh, now Lori, like Charles, comes across the Avow website, becomes a member, and starts spending a lot of her time online there. She starts reading Chad's posts obsessively, listening to his podcast appearances. She tells Bubba Humps that he should check them out too. And of course he does because he's clearly in love with her and not in a brotherly way and is her fucking lapdog. When she saw that Chad was speaking at a prepper conference in Utah in 2018 called Preparing a People, PAP, right? she decides they got to go. Chad had already done a couple of these conferences, not really sticking out among the other attendees, you know, like hypnotherapists or people who argue that the earth's core is made of ice. <laughs> Another speaker at one of these uh, conferences claimed he had Joseph Smith's sword. Mm Mm-hmm. Sounds like some A-plus top-shelf people watching. Compared to some of these other characters, Chad was kind of tame. Seemed kind of quiet, not too sure of himself. So after a few rounds of not really making waves in this community, Chad decides to up his game, starts talking a lot about past lives. Chad is now also saying that he has received a numbering system from God that helps him understand how many lives a person has lived and whether they were a light or dark spirit. Right, the seeds of his future zombie talk. Bullshit. Also began bringing a necklace with a silver chain and a dark pendant on the end to these meetings and and inviting people to ask questions that he believed the necklace would answer for them. Okay, so now this Looney Tune has a a fucking cheap necklace version of the Magic 8-Ball. If it swayed one way, it meant yes. The other way would mean no. Uh, It sounds similar to pendulum dowsing, uh, a divinatory practice embraced in a lot of New Age circles where uh, a current holds a crystal pendulum and inquires of it for answers on big decisions. <laughs> if, you're, if you're basing the, a lot of the big decisions of your life on a swinging pendulum, please go see a therapist. Uh, Chad also started talking about how people had other spouses and other lives. This plays directly into the groupy energy that many would observe in these conferences. And secretly, he started telling people like Julie Rowe that his wife Tammy was only, quote, 1%, no, sorry, 0.01% in her body. Zombies, man. Zombies are corroding her soul. And there's almost nothing left of of the real her. So already thinking about getting rid of his wife, who I'm sure is just like, what the fuck are you doing with all this stuff? Uh, Quick diversion back to Lori now. In April of 2018, a problem of hers takes care of itself. That month, neighbors started to complain about a smell emanating from third husband Joe Ryan's Phoenix apartment. And no one had seen the man in days. The police were called after a neighbor had peered in the window and seen a lot of flies inside his apartment, asked if officers could come do a welfare check. When police entered the second floor apartment in a desert brown building with a tile roof, they found the 59-year-old man lying dead on his bed. They estimated that given the advanced state of decomposition of his body, he had died of a heart attack within the previous week. Maggots had already begun to eat away at his body. The apartment was sad. The apartment was uh, one of a lonely man. Little furniture, paper stacked on the floor, a printer and a laptop and a, a box for an electric toothbrush sitting on the carpet, lottery tickets and a blood pressure monitor sitting on a desk. The only decorations were framed photos of his daughter, Tylee. Man, this poor bastard. Tylee would be the beneficiary of his life insurance, $350,000 payout. But until she was 18, Lori would have control of that money, and she undoubtedly started spending that fucking shit to buy books, you know, uh, from her favorite author, Chad fucking Ding Dong Daybell, and go see him. And when Lori uh, sees Chad live for the first time at the Preparing a People conference I already mentioned in St. George, Utah, October 26, 2018, Sparks were immediate. She'd come with a friend, Melanie Gibb, whom Chad had met a year prior at another preparedness camp in Utah. Melanie and Lori were sisters eternally, they believed, reincarnated life after life as close relatives. In her phone, Lori saved Melanie's number as Phoebe, the name of the girl she believed she had birthed sometime in the 1600s. That's cool. So they are both uh, super mentally stable, as of course is Chad and everyone else at these conferences. 
And as Melanie stood next to her, Chad said she wanted to meet Chad for a, she had, she had wanted to meet Chad for a very long time. Lori wanted to talk to Chad about his book, The Renewed Earth, a novel he published in 2011 as a finale to his Standing in Holy Places series. In the author's note, Chad characterized the major plot points of the series as prophesied events that he had published first uh, as fiction and had come to realize, uh, you know, were true later. The time to prepare does seem to be growing short, he wrote. For the rest of the conference, Lori seemed to orbit him. She attended all his lectures. She stood next to his table in between lectures when he's trying to sell stuff. She straightened his books, you know, without him asking her to even do that. She starts offering his customers insights into her favorite titles. And at the end of the conference, they share a romantic kiss. Later, Chad will write about the beginning of the relationship or continuation of it, depending on how reliable you find Chad, in a series of text messages he sent to Lori, which he strung together like an erotic fiction novel. Uh, in these, uh, you know, text, text, he calls himself James and calls Lori Elena. Three years later, the police will obtain all these messages and make them public record. Uh, Chad wrote of, quote, his loins being on fire when the pair kissed, end quote. And after Lori helped uh, heft boxes of books to his car at the end of the day and they hugged in the parking lot, Chad wrote he had to, quote, disguise the massive erection he was experiencing. They traded cell numbers and like teenagers texted back and forth until four in the morning. Uh, Chad said he even got out of bed twice to get dressed to go see her in the middle of the night. But the voice put a hand on his shoulder and told him to stay calm. The voice said, quote, have patience. Everything will work out as it is supposed to. In due time, you will come so hard. Uh, wonder if the voice told him to go uh, beat off and fall asleep. Chad, this is the voice. Uh, do not let this she-devil ruin your life at this time, Chad. You are just horny. Beat off, fall asleep. Go back to your wife. Uh, that night he believed her spirit joined him in his hotel bed. Totally. Yeah, they had spirit sex or something. He had visions of the intense passion of their lovemaking from centuries ago. Uh, the emotions they shared were not of this world. The fuck? I think Chad has visions confused with wet dreams, sexual fantasies. Uh, Lucifina thinks so as well. Chad now starts to receive more visions that make his desire to cheat on his wife seem not only okay, but necessary, godly. Uh, in the LDS church, you know, marriage is of course sacred. If couples are sealed in an LDS temple, as Chad and Tammy were in 1990, their marriage is believed to be eternal. Chad and Lori now start to believe they could be polygamous, not in this life, but in their eternal lives. They believed that they had been married before already in past lives, but because the veil had clouded their vision, they could not recognize themselves and married the wrong people in this life. But now they could still be together again because their past marriages from past lives, you know, were sealed and these sealed marriages are still relevant and valid today. If anything, they were cheating on each other with their current spouses. Ah, the human ability to rationalize almost fucking anything. So impressive. If you want something bad enough and you're willing to get a little creative, you can make nearly any choice. Maybe maybe any choice at all, actually. Seem sensible, necessary even. Chad told Lori that they had first been married during the time of Jesus. Back then, Chad believed he had lived as James the Just, a biblical figure. Lori had been James the Just's wife, Elena daughter of Jesus' half-brother. They'd birthed seven children, one of whom was now living as Melanie Bordeaux in a, you know, another life, the real-life daughter of Lori's deceased older sister, Stacy, And one, one of their sons was now living as J.J. Vallow. These two should have been institutionalized. After they met in 2018, Chad emailed Lori details about all her past lives and the past lives of the people they kept close around them. Among their friends were no sinners, only saints. That's, that's cool. Past Mormon prophets and pioneers, warriors who fought in the great battle between the Nephites and the Lamanites. Almost everyone but Chad and Lori was a granddaughter of a, or spouse of a saint, some peripheral biblical character. Chad and Lori were more special, more important. Lori in another life had been married to Moroni himself, the Nephite warrior who appeared as an angel in a blinding holy light at the bedside of Joseph Smith. In emails to Lori, Chad classified everyone they knew in tears based on how many lives they'd already lived and also designated each person, as I went over earlier, as being light or dark. And luckily, all their friends were light at this time. Our ex-husband, Joe Ryan, though, he was dark. He was dark. He was now sealed away. Uh, Tylee, her teenage daughter, also dark. JJ, though, is light. By the time Chad told Lori these things, uh, you know, they wouldn't have been completely foreign concepts to her. She had been an avid listener to both Chad's and Julie Rose podcasts where they would speak openly about these strange ideas. And she accepted them wholesale. Both these lovebirds now had two big problems in their lives due to their desires to be with each other, their spouses. Chad was desperate to get away from his wife, Tammy. But how? 
All he could think about was Lori. So many hot boner and wet puss and loophole and eager tongues and lips filled spirit visions. Who knew the Lord could project so much pornography into one man's head? Chad would see Lori again in three weeks when uh, preparing a people was holding a special event in Mesa. In the meantime, they talked on the phone every day. Lori spent some of these uh, interim days going to her local LDS temple for up to eight hours at a time, listening to fringe podcasts, telling her family that her past lives had allowed her to transcend basic human needs like eating and going to the bathroom. So she is fucking batshit crazy now. Brother Humps, uh, Alex, he's loving all this. He seemed to believe everything his sister said, right? Maybe maybe she was uh, also using Bubba Hump's earthly vessel for some sexual practice to prepare for her upcoming horn dog rendezvous with Chatty Doomsday Daddy. Lori was also spending more and more time with her friend Melanie Gibb. Preparing to people had named Melanie recently as its Arizona branch representative. What an incredible honor. Uh, Melanie now organized casual religious discussions in the homes of people she knew from church who wanted to talk about the second coming, prepping, multiple probations, topics that would have been frowned upon by their bishop. The meeting seemed to attract people who had undergone a lot of hardships, loss, death, and divorce. Lori would frequently testify at these meetings. Lori would introduce herself at one meeting by stating, I'll just start by saying that I'm a personal witness of the resurrected Jesus Christ. I am his advocate and I am his friend. (laughs) That's okay, cool. And he is with me. I know him. And it was a hard road to get to know him. It was not an easy road. When people hear my story, they're like, I can't believe you did that. I can't believe you lived through that. I can't believe that you're still here. It is life-changing and eternity altering. I have been ministered to by the angel Moroni. I've seen him. I've had lots of angelic ministry with people who wake me up at four o'clock in the morning and tell me things to do. I no longer need to sleep very much because I'm woken up constantly by angels giving me instructions uh, on things that I can do to help further the father's work. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Both her and Chad receiving a lot of visions, talking to lots of angels, talking to Moroni, you know, talking to Jesus, hanging out with uh, everybody in heaven's VIP room. She told other media members about her ex-husband, Joe Ryan, who was very awful, who raped my children. Again, I do not think he did. He was a master of disguise, she told him, a very good showman who in court made her look crazy. Fucking what? What? He made her look crazy? She said the judges believed him instead of me. And he was constantly trying to get custody of my three-year-old daughter. I was going to murder him, she said. I was going to kill him. Like the scriptures say, like Nephi killed, just to stop the pain and stop him coming after me and to stop him coming after my children. Lori confessed she had searched the scriptures for justification to murder her ex-husband and believed she had found permission in the pages of Doctrine and Covenants, section 98. And then, if he shall come upon you or your children or your children's children unto the third and fourth generation, I have delivered thine enemy into thine hands. Kind of weird that they stop at fourth generation, right? <laughs> like, like, yeah, you can kill somebody if they come after your children or like your grandkids, your great-grandkids. But if somebody comes after your great-grandkids, don't even, you're fucking, you're too old. You're too old to try and kill him. Stop it. Uh, But instead of murdering him, she said she turned her life over to the Lord. Or he happened to die of natural causes before she got the chance to have her brother murder him. I definitely believe had he not had a heart attack, Alex would have killed him. Uh, Recently in the LDS temple, she told other meeting members, God showed her a pre-mortal memory, a vision of who she had always been, who she had always been destined to become. She said, I got to see myself as a warrior fighting for the savior. And I was one of the strongest warriors. I saw it. And he showed me so that I could never deny it again. I was not sweet. And I was not innocent. I am old. I have fought. I have fought in this war for millennia. That's who I am. And I came down here to be a warrior and fight. And I only thought that I was sweet and innocent. Always delusions of grandeur with these idiots. (laughs) Never visions of mediocrity. Never, never visions of being like, you know, above average, but not like way above average in the past, you know, or in the visions of the future, which proves to me at least uh, how all of this is, you know, always nothing more than ego and hubris. No one ever has a fucking vision of being like one of God's warriors, but not like a great warrior. No one has a vision of fighting for God, but not fighting that well. No, no one's ever the warrior who's kind of slow making it to the fight. You know, they keep, they, they're trying their best to slay demons and zombies and stuff, you know, but they're fucking, they're scary. They're fucking scary. So they hang back just a little ways out of the action and just let the better fighters do most of the killing. And then, you know, they'll step in here and there and stab a, a few orcs or, or, you know, dragons or demons or whatever when they're wounded. Lori also went on to predict an end time scenario in which women would be equal warriors to men fighting side by side in a spiritual battlefield. Indeed, she preached a, a weird kind of pseudo feminism at these meetings. 
Lori also sowed the seeds of dissent, saying that they would need to dwell among the most pure people for the Savior to choose them. But most of all, Lori told everyone to stay focused on their mission and not to worry so much about their families or their kids. <laughs> Seriously, this was her message. Fuck your kids. God's sick of you being attentive parents. You need to focus on preparing to help God defeat Satan in this big dragon fucking zombie demon orc battle. You don't need to worry, she said. If you're going to be the only one left of your whole family, that's okay. Because your kids are adults in eternity. They're not your kids. They're loaned to you for this short time. Doesn't even matter if they die. Uh, in November, Chad flies to Arizona for his appearance at another pap event. Old fucking chatty pap smear. Lori picks him up from the airport. Drives to a nearby hotel where they fucking dry hump so hard. Chad later wrote the passionate magic they had felt centuries earlier came surging back powerfully. In the room, they flung themselves onto the couch where Lori straddled him effortlessly as if they had done this a thousand times before. They pressed their loins tightly against each other. Their, the feeling was exquisite and they both smiled and moaned at the sensation passing between them. They were still fully clothed. Chad wrote in his text message recollection of their erotic rendezvous. Chad suddenly stopped. He raised his hands to Lori's head now and began to run them down her entire body, blessing and purifying each part of her. Quote, he could feel the pains and troubles she had endured throughout her life being removed from her soul and being taken outside and destroyed. James' hands, he's James, worked their way down her body and lingered briefly on her beautiful breasts. I bet he lingered more than briefly. She probably had a lot of extra pain and trouble in her tits. So being a good godly healer, he had to spend a lot of extra time rubbing, licking, maybe sucking out the trauma. I bet her clit was fucking traumatized too. Fucking, he had to really massage the trauma out of her clit. He finished blessing her and, quote, then filled her body with a balm of light and love. Is that cum? Is that what he's talking about? Is a balm of light and love his cum geyser? Uh, he wrote, I love you, Elena. <laughs> the next day, he wrote that they, quote, blessed each other again. These fucking idiots. Uh, you know, and by blessed, he means aggressively dry humping, you know. Uh, they made plans to meet in the morning at the nearby LDS temple where they intended to be sealed together forever as husband and wife, even though they were, you know, already sealed in the temple to other people. At the Preparing a People conference, Chad and Lori were distracted, eager to be alone together again. These horny idiots. All they care about right now is the end of days, but also fucking a whole bunch before the end of days. Uh, Chad doesn't care at all that he's pseudo riding a used bicycle with a lot of miles on it. That bike, despite being taken off a lot of ramps, thrown down quite a few ditches, still way hotter than the bike he has at home. This bike? Soon, it won't ask him to slow down when he starts riding it really fast. You know, it won't, it won't tell him he can't try and pop a wheelie or, or, or jump it off a handicap ramp or, or stick his dick in between the handlebars or stick his dick in the air hole in the rear tire, right? This bike likes to ride hard and fast and riding Lori's bike as hard as possible is all Chatty Doomsday Daddy wants to do. This pair sold books together at Chad's table. And then they left dinner with friends that evening to drive to a secluded area where they pulled off the road, jumped into the backseat of Lori's car for another supposedly fully clothed dry hump session. Uh, that night, Chad stayed at a, in a guest bedroom at Lori's house where several female attendees from the conference and friends uh, from Gibbs meetings were also staying. Charles was out of town on business. That night, Chad gave several uh, attendee, female attendees blessings not sure if he specifically blessed her tits a little extra, uh, after which these women claimed to have full-on visions. Does that mean orgasms? Including one of the entire Phoenix area decimated by some unseen disaster. Only the LDS church was saved, of course. Lori told them she had seen the exact same thing. Afterward, in the living room, the women gathered on the couch and Chad sat on a coffee table in front of them and told them he had info to share with them about what he called translation. He began to tell the women about the physical, emotional, and spiritual levels one needed to ascend in order to become a translated being and shared with them his scoring system. This guy loves a scoring system uh, to assess just how translated people were. Chad was now teaching that translated beings did not require food or sleep. They had, <laughs> they had accelerated healing powers and they could not be mortally wounded and they could also teleport. <laughs> Sounds fucking sick. He told them he had a portal in his house, uh, where he could go to convene with spiritual beings from beyond the veil, who he was working with to help prepare for the second coming. Oh, man, that's fucking handy. How, how convenient to have a divine portal in your house, right? Really cuts down in the, on the commute time when you have to be traveling back and forth between heaven and earth a bunch. Good for him. 
After all these weirdos had gone to bed, Chad opened the door to his room in order to sneak over to Lori's uh, bedroom. But lo, behold, Lori is sneaking towards his room already. She slipped into his bedroom. They locked the door and continued the tryst they'd begun earlier. Chad would write in his erotic text message story, only two thin layers of material separated their loins and they could feel each other's most intimate body parts in detail. The intensity and spiritual vibration exceeded anything either one of them had already felt before or had ever felt before. Ah, oh, just fuck already, you idiot. At this point in Chad's retelling, he stopped referring to himself as James, a callback to his so-called previous identity. And instead, with no explanation, now he starts to call himself Raphael. Yeah, why not? In the morning, Chad offered more blessings to the group. <laughs> Extra time with the tits, probably. Over the next eight months, uh, a group of five or so women would come together at Lori or Melanie's house, all LDS, all mothers, mostly blonde, and all revolving around the words of Chad Daybell. How many of these women was he dry humping? How much clothed puss was he rubbing his clothed cock against? How mangled was his dick thanks to constant friction burns? And none of the other women seemed to be as devoted to Chad as Lori. She and Chad were the closest, which meant she had the most authority in the group. These two talk every day on the phone, talking about how they have special powers, <laughs> like teleportation, uh, conjuring natural disasters, receiving visions. Man, how fun to teleport. What a great power to have if you're having an affair, right? Now you, have to, you don't have to hide money. You know, all the, all the money you're spending on airplane tickets and hotel rooms. No, you just fucking whip, just zip over to where, wherever they are and dry hump them. You know, whoop, they just zip over and dry hump you for a little bit. Uh, the two talked a lot about how all the light and dark spirits around them, you know, uh, what they were up to. Lori's husband, Charles, you know, he used to be light. But, uh, well, that fucker got dark around this time. The, the, weirdly, the more Lori kind of rubbed her clit uh, up against Chad's kind of dick through clothing, the darker he would become. Uh, by early 2019, he was a lost cause. He'd been possessed by an evil spirit, by a demon zombie thing named Ned, <laughs> named Ned Schneider. I love that demon zombie has a first and last name. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to mix up this de uh, Ned demon with all the other Ned demons. Is that, is that Ned Johnson? No, 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 that's Ned Schneider. It's a different demon. Ned Schneider. Uh, this demon sounds even lamer than, the, than Barry the demon from the Jill DeRay suck. Lori now fighting with Charles more and more at home. <laughs> Starts calling him Ned Schneider to his face. Telling their nephew, Zach, that his uncle is dead and is a wicked zombie named Ned living inside her husband's body, right? Zombie, the code word they use to indicate for someone who's gone dark. And anyone could become a zombie. You have to be careful, right? At any point, you can become possessed by a demon spirit or, or she said, a demon worm or demon slug controlled by Lucifer. You got to watch out for spirits, worms, and slugs. And if one of these things gets in you, well, fuck, now you're a zombie. There's no coming back. Right? The only way you can unzombie yourself, the only way to get that evil spirit to leave your body is through death. The only way to keep a spirit from lingering in limbo is to kill the body it possesses, which can be tricky for Chad and Lori because, you know, they're now immortal. Did I mention that they're immortal now and can't be killed or seriously injured? Yeah, yeah. No, they're fucking Highlanders now is what they're telling themselves. Lori is telling people that she has lived 21 lives on various planets. <laughs> Chad, Chad has lived 31. Uh, here on Earth, both of them had already lived five previous lives. Chad is now saying that uh, after living two mortal lives, people can choose to sign a light contract or a dark contract and that each time you're reborn, the veil between the mortal world and the spirit world will thin. So the more lives you've you know, lived previously, the e more easily you can teleport or hop into your fucking portal or whatever and, and go back and forth between the spirit world and this world. And of course, you know, people can be sealed to multiple spouses in the temple as Ch Chad and Lori were. Uh, Chad also sends Lori a list of the seven missions they need to accomplish together. One of their missions was to translate ancient records and write a book about how people can become translated beings like themselves. The other six missions revolved mostly around humping with just a little bit of clothes on, you know, or, uh, or humping, you know, there was a few missions about, you know, no clothes being on just some bareback bike riding humping. No, uh, one of their other missions was to search Northern Arizona for locations for 10 cities, the white camps and figure out how to distribute food and supplies. They would become, as a duo, the presidency of the Church of the Firstborn, right? The, the head of the 144,000, so that's pretty awesome. In a closet in Lori's spacious Arizona home, Chad even, quote, set up a portal for her <laughs> so she could use that to teleport and access him now, at least spiritually. That's sweet. 
God, which I wish I would have fucking built a portal for touring all these years. So much easier to get to gigs if you can just port, you know, teleport. Chad warned uh, Lori to be careful with her portal. <laughs> he said that portals were pathways that both light and dark spirits could, could pass through. Is he talking about portal or pussy here? Is he warning her to be careful with the portal or pussy? All of this, as you might imagine, had some seriously negative effects on Lori's message to Charles. It's falling apart by late 2018. That fall, Lori brought JJ and Tylee to stay with her at Melanie Gibbs for a time. She stopped attending church on Sundays, fearful that if she went, Charles would have divorce papers served to her at her ward. She wasn't ready to leave him because she still needed his money, at least until Chad could, you know, take care of her. She knew that eventually she'd run out of Joe Ryan's life insurance money for fucking Tylee that she was stealing. To try and keep her relationship with Chad a secret, Lori was becoming a master of deception. She was carrying at least three disposable burner phones in her, fur- in her purse, including one that was reserved explicitly for Chad. Meanwhile, Chad, it seems, was planting seeds for a future not just with Lori, but with multiple Mormon women, many of them with troubled family lives. He told one woman named uh, Zulema, Zulema Pastenas, that her powers are getting stronger and soon she'd be able to see through the eyes of the Lord himself. In a mid-January text, she asked him to assess her level of light. He said she was a solid 4.3 L, but you were already exalted on a previous world and were chosen by the Savior to come again because of all the great work you've done and will do. It means you are one of the greatest women on earth. Really building up a uh, self-esteem of his closest followers. Uh, when Charles Vallow arrives back in Phoenix after a business trip on January 30th, 2019, he finds himself in a real maritable mess or marital mess. Things had escalated considerably. His truck, the one he would parked in the airport lot when he flew out of town, was now nowhere to be found. He suspected it had not been stolen, but had been moved by Lori. Charles pulled out his iPhone, called his bishop, asked for a ride home from the airport. Once Charles arrives in front of his house, the house he, Lori, JJ, and Tylee had just moved into at the beginning of the year, uh, this house is now empty, and he calls the Gilbert Police Department. Right? He needed help. He couldn't get into his house. I mean, he could see him, but couldn't get in. Couldn't reach his children or get a hold of his wife, and he's worried. She's lost her mind. I don't know how else to say it, Charles explained to Gilbert Police Officer Chris Dorenbush outside the house. We're LDS, he continued. She thinks she's a resurrected being and a god and a member of the 144,000. Jesus is coming next year. <laughs> Man. Charles didn't seem to know how to tell the complete, uh, or, you know, the complicated, convoluted story of what he'd been dealing with. Uh, he didn't feel like he could tell the officer that Lori now referred to him as Ned Schneider. All he could say was Lori was going crazy and she'd withdrawn $3,500 from their bank account and said she was going to kill him. She said, you're not Charles. I don't know what you are or what you did with Charles, but I can murder you now with my powers. <laughs> Doran Bush asked, okay, so she's speaking as a spiritual being now? She's lost her reality, Charles said. It's gotten really, really bad lately. She goes to the temple every day and speaks with Moroni and Jesus Christ, and they tell her what to do. And now she came here today, and the last couple of days she says, you're not Charles, you're Nick Schneider? He sounded hesitant, as though he wasn't sure the officer would believe him. I don't know where she gets these names from. She's got all this stuff from these people in Utah who tell her how many past lives she's had and probation she's had. He didn't mention that Lori had told him that she had been married to Moroni in a past life and to James the Just. As expected, Dornbush interrupted, uh, okay, this is all foreign to me. It's just as foreign to me, Charles Vallow said. All he wanted, he added, was an emergency mental health evaluation for Lori and wanted to know that JJ was okay. Uh, he advised Doran Bush, you're a dark spirit is what she's going to tell you. I'm a dark spirit. She won't go to a doctor because they would find out she's translated. She cannot be killed. She cannot die. Doran Bush walked carefully into the home after Charles was allowed to force his way in. Inside, he saw nothing except for Charles' belongings, which had been packed away and hidden behind masses of food storage and supplies Lori had uh, stocked up for the end of days. Next morning, Vala would meet with officers from the Gilbert Police Department. He reiterated that Lori had gone off the deep end. She didn't care what happened to him. She didn't care what happened to her kids. Several hours later, Lori sat in the lobby at the Gilbert Police Station with Melanie Gibb and her daughter, Tylee. And hot damn, did she put on a show. She had those male officers wrapped around her finger in a way Lucifina would admire if Lori wasn't such a piece of shit. Lori wore all black, black pants, black tailored coat, black boots, long, full blonde hair, freshly curled. Uh, Melanie and Tylee looked like uh, members of her staff. The three followed a young officer in training back to a white-walled interview room, and inside, Lori and Tylee sat down at a small gray table with Melanie perched on a chair off to the side. An older police officer, Officer Tom Edgerton, joined them, settling into a chair in the corner, and he asked Lori her side of the story. The day before, she said she and Charles had an argument over the phone while he was gone on business. She said, I found some stuff that he's been doing. 
And he was really defensive. And so I took the kids. We spent the night in a hotel because I knew he was coming home. The stuff he had been doing uh, was Lori's suspicion that Vallow was paying for prostitutes and financially supporting two other women, which she had texted his sister, Kay Woodcock, about that day. I found out yesterday from my credit card that Charles has been entertaining prostitutes, she wrote. Of course, I was pretty upset when I confronted him over the phone yesterday. I highly doubt he was doing this. <laughs> Just more like, and who would use a fucking, pro, uh, a, like what married guy is going to use a credit card to pay for escort service? Like, come on. Like, no, okay, I can see like going to the ATM a lot. She's suspicious, withdrawing a lot of cash and doesn't know what, but, like what was, what did the credit card statement say? You know, it's fucking Barbara's brothel. $400 charge. Uh, she wanted uh, Kate Woodcock to know that she had JJ with her and he is having fun, she said. That morning, she brought JJ to school as she always did. She then told the officers that her husband must have taken her purse out of the car while she was in the school. My phone, my wallet, my money, my everything was in there, she said. The sunroof of her black infinity had been opened so JJ's service dog, Bailey, could get some fresh air and he must have reached in. Meanwhile, Lori said, Valo used her cell phone to text her family and friends, impersonating me and had kicked in the door to their house she said she didn't tell him where she was, uh, you know, where she was for her safety. That Charles was trying to make her look crazy for his own gain because she'd found out he was cheating. And again, none of this, uh, I don't think any of this is true. This is just uh, her, you know, fucking degrading Charles's character to make herself look better and, you know, get what she wants. Now the officers seem to think that they can write this whole thing off as a domestic dispute. They called Charles who uh, said, you know, he'd call him right back because uh, he didn't, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, when he did, he said he had an order to hold his wife for a medical evaluation. The cops reported that to Lori, advised her that if she didn't want an evaluation, she should just uh, just not answer the door when cops come to it. So they're 100% on her side now. She's playing them like a fiddle. They clearly thought that there was no way that Lori was a danger to herself or others. She's not talking about zombies, any of that shit now. Soon the cops and Lori are joking around about how nice it would be to go on a little mental health vacation away from the stress of work and family. Shortly afterwards, she does comply with the mental health assessment, voluntarily checking in to a nearby facility where she's released after just a few hours because she is so good at manipulating people. And then she disappears for two months. In the first few days of February 2019, Lori and Tylee arrive unannounced at the airport in Kauai, uh, in Hawaii, where Lori uh, calls an old friend and asks if she can um, pick them up at the airport. Tells her friend that she'd left Charles once and for all, had taken 50000 from his bank account and was going to start over in Hawaii. JJ is not with him. Uh, Lori left him behind in Arizona. She stayed with a friend named April Raymond, whom Lori knew from living in Hawaii years prior. For the first few days, April thought Lori just uh, had, you know, excuse me, Lori, April thought that Lori had just changed a lot. Maybe having some kind of midlife crisis. Then Lori started talking about how there was a demon living in Charles. And April was like, what was that? Lori told April she had really come to Hawaii to gather her as part of the 144,000. And if April joined her mission, together they could travel the world finding all the other chosen people. But in order to be a part of this mission, April would have to leave her kids behind in Hawaii with her dad. And Lori could not for, say certain, for certain if she would ever see them again. April now told Lori, uh, yeah, thanks, but no thanks. Not interested. <laughs> also told Lori that Lori was going to need to find a new place to stay. Can you imagine if, if an old friend of yours from the past showed up at your place with all this fucking crazy Lori now began renting a room in a nearby resort community. Uh, on one occasion in late February, she texted Zalema Pastenis, uh, told her she had flown over to Oahu for the day in order to spend time in an LDS temple there. She said, I commanded with the clouds and rain to cease for the whole day today. Added that it worked. Lori was learning more about her ability, she said. Over text, Lori confided in Zalema that she thought Charles Valla was blocking her spiritual gifts and discussed a blessing Chad had given Zulema in which he said she would travel through portals. They also talked about their bodies changing. Zulema thought she was going through menopause previously, but now she was having her period again after not having one for a year. Was this, she asked Lori, a sign that their bodies were becoming younger? Lori responded, that's an interesting question because I was starting to slow down, but now they are like 20-year-old periods. <laughs> Chad's healing powers. Oh my gosh, aren't they something? He's clearly been spending a lot of time blessing their pusses. What a couple lucky ladies. He's doing a lot of puss reju rejuvenation work on them. Uh, Lori said that the other members of the group had also remarked that their menstrual cycles were changing and they had all somehow synced to the same monthly cycle. <laughs> so Emma then asked, what's the rate at which we change? Four days younger every day. Lori now pulled out of her ass. 
both remarked that their periods were heavy and crampy. A uh, similitude of the only begotten father, Lori explained to Zilema, or similitude. Sorry, that word's a little tricky. A similitude of the blood sacrifice. It reminds us that we belong to Jesus. Wow, how intense. <laughs> they're, having, they're having Christ cramps now and Messiah flows. What a shame to be wasting all their special menstrual Jesus blood on tampons and pads, right? They should have went to the temple and told the bishop, no need to, br- <laughs> to bring out the bread or blessed water for today's sacrament. Uh-uh, the faithful can just lap from our loins. Lori and Zilema could have been human sacrament dispensers sharing the Lord's sweet, sweet period blood. Drink that metallic tasting salvation right from the source. Meanwhile, Charles, Charles began divorce proceedings back in Arizona also petitioning to to gain temporary custody of JJ. He has no idea where Lori is. He wrote an email to her expressing his confusion or everything that had happened between them. He told her that her accusations were ridiculous. You are my one and only for 14 years, period. He had no idea he was not her one and only, right? She's been letting another lover ride her bike. I mean, so far he's had to wear a helmet and crash pads and stuff, but still riding. In the divorce paperwork, he mentioned that Lori had taken JJ's iPad, which he depended on as well as his medication. Then in March, Lori returned home and Vallow dismissed the divorce petition. Told his lawyer that despite everything, despite how fucking batshit insane she is, she still has the best pussy he's ever seen. And he wanted a chance. No, he, he did say that he wanted a chance to get back together though. This poor bastard. Oh, this will not happen. Uh, Lori is, yeah, not going to reconcile. Lori organizes a weekend long retreat for the group of women who had gathered earlier in the year with Chatty Daddy. At first, she brainstormed gathering at the hotel in Scottsdale, but eventually they settled on having the retreat at Zulema's house. In attendance are Lori, Zulema, Melanie Gibb, and a woman named Serena Sharp, who flew out to Arizona from New England. Chad had last seen Sharp at a preparing a people conference near Boise the month before. At the conference, she hung out in a hotel room with Melanie Gibb, Zulema. Chad had come by the room to speak to the women, give them special blessings, aka boob squeezings. Sharp will later allege that he told the women not to be surprised if they heard news that his wife... Tammy Daybell had just died in a car accident. That's a fucking weird thing to say about someone currently alive and well. Chad said he needed to complete his earthly mission and for some reason that could not happen until she was dead. And none of these idiots now call the police to report what Chad has just said, right? His wife, her life is clearly in danger. After the conference, Sharp uh, drove over to Rexburg to look at property. She was interested in moving her family from the East Coast. Chad met up with Sharp at the BYU-Idaho campus, told her that her husband was also likely to die suddenly. Mm Mm-hmm. Clearly, he's kind of trying to set things up so that they can uh, all be together. Instead of getting the fuck away from this madman, Sharp still decides to travel to Arizona for the retreat at Zalema's house in March. Once all the women had gathered at Zalema's house, Lori gave them new names, right? People they'd been in other lives. Melanie Gibb becomes Phoebe. Sharp becomes Raina. Uh, Lori's niece, Melanie Bordeaux, is called Miriam. Uh, When Lori didn't know how to say a name, she would just pull out her cell phone and call Chad to clarify. All of this was because, as Lori explained, Satan was ramping up his powers on earth and the evil was so pervasive in this world. All of them needed to work together to rid the world of evil and each of them had a critical power to do so. Serena Sharp was water, like a water elemental. (laughs) Zulema was earth. Over the next few months, Lori would mostly work alone with Chad over the phone to systematically clear dark souls from the face of the planet by performing weird fucking rituals. In April, she texted Zulema that they had cleared several states. Working on the world, Lori told her, we cleared over 660 million in the U.S. alone. Also, did Canada, Mexico, Greenland. Is Greenland really worth mentioning? Right? There's like 17 people over there. Also, there's not 660 million people total in the U.S. So so how could they clear that number? Right? Are like multiple demons infecting single souls? (laughs) Sorry, I I, I keep trying to apply apply, uh, logic to this drivel. On several occasions, Lori, Zilema, Melanie, Serena, and sometimes others would hold their casting circles over Zoom, making arrangements through text. On occasion, they peppered their communications with emojis of the female symbol, a reminder of the uniquely feminine power they believed their circle contained. Not sure if Chatty Daddy would have uh, approved of that, right? Due to the action heroes, right? Easy, ladies. Easy. Can you text me a list of the powers we are going to use? Lori texted Zilema after a Zoom meeting in May. <laughs> Zulema wrote back, uh, crystals, vibrating fire, ice, water, lightning, wind, storm, sky, fiery, uh, cherubim. Fucking vibrating fire? That's a new one. Fire that vibrates? I'm not sure exactly what that even means. 
but you know, it does sound pretty sick. Later that month, Lori informs Ulema that Serena Sharp, who she uh, had thought could control water in their casting circles, was unfortunately now in the process of turning into a dark spirit. <laughs> well, who's going to control the water now in the witch coven? I mean, Christian study group, or I'm actually not sure, sure what they are at this point. It's getting harder and harder to track. My heart is aching, Zulema texted Chad. How do I make sense of this? Is this another trial of faith? God, these poor bastards. There's always something they have to deal with. Fucking demon zombies. Always trying to ruin their magic circles. Chad said that Serena Sharp had been texting him with a lot of questions. And he didn't feel good about her anymore either. Soon, Sharp would be ousted from the group, and rightfully so. She'll later tell police in Idaho that she was kicked out for, quote, asking too many questions. Once Lori had told her she was growing dark, she'd started to ask what that meant. Who, what was this dark thing? Who was dark? Who was light? How do you become dark or light? Right? How dare she want to know what she's uh, accused of becoming? The fucking nerve of this ungrateful half ass water witch. She also pushed back when Lori said that the group uh, didn't need to repent for sins in the Bible. Lori had said uh, that they would not be tried for anything you did. Okay? And that sounded to Serena a lot like being above the law. In June of 2019, uh, Charles Vallow's marriage to Lori is not surprisingly hanging on by a thread. He's the only one holding that thread. Two are now living apart with Lori and the kids moving into a spacious house with a pool in the backyard in Chandler, another Phoenix suburb, a house that Charles is, you know, paying for them to stay in. So that's, that's cool. Charles moved back to Houston where JJ visited sometimes. Charles had no idea that Lori was now referring to him as Hiplos. Hiplos, the zombie demon, dark energy thing guy. On June 2nd, Lori and Zulema tried to use their fire powers now to, cr <laughs> to crash Charles's truck uh, with him in it. For some reason, uh, it didn't work. For, for some reason, they weren't able to conjure up enough vibrating flames to take out his truck. This is so insane. Grown-ass women, not locked away in psychiatric treatment centers, actually thinking, truly believing, they can use their firepower to take somebody out, right? Ugh. Later, these two halfwits realized that JJ would have been in Charles' truck the day they tried to conjure their fire spell. Zulema now wondered, God, what would have happened to him if the car crashed? As Zulema would later explain to investigators, Lori told her that would have been fine. You know, JJ was not going to be around much long anyway, much longer, right? He needed to pass on soon because he had another mission to complete in the celestial realm. So she had, a no, prob she had no problem trying to cause a car crash that would speed that up, right? JJ's days are numbered, uh, but not because of any vision. After this spell disaster, Lori wants to plan another meeting of the group of women in order to perform another casting. <sighs> June 9th, <laughs> she calls the women together, asking them to fast in advance, right? Get your power built up, build up your chi. And then at the meeting, they'll break the fast together, which is, I guess, pretty powerful. Uh, Zulema was there, Melanie Gibb, Lori's niece, Melanie uh, Bordreau is there. I kept forgetting to add that R in her last name. Newcomer Christina Atwood came and, became a, and brought a friend named Nicole. They all gathered at Salema's house and stood in a circle praying for Lori's family and performing another death casting on Charles. Oh, and there was one more person here, Bubba Humps, Lori's fuck brother. Uh, Lori explained to the group that they needed some hot brother dick. I mean, male energy in their circle. Apparently, nobody there other than Lori really liked him. Christina uh, found Alex to be loud and boisterous and completely unpleasant. Afterward, as they all ate dinner together, they talked about the casting they just performed on Lori's estranged husband. And Christina would later say, Alex, I think twice in the evening, said something to the effect of he wished he could just kill Charles. And then Lori that night made a comment about having crushed up some pills and put it in Charles' protein powder or shake stuff. And Christina was shocked. There were more interesting revelations as well. Both Melanie's told the group they were divorcing their husbands. Lori's niece, Melanie, claiming that her husband, Brandon, was gay. Melanie Gibb didn't give a reason for hers, but it seemed like uh, just about everyone wanted to do away with the most important people in their lives. Cult, cult, cult. These fuckers are holding them back from their divine missions. By late June, Lori created a new email account in Charles's name and sent a long email to Chad. Hello, Chad, the email began. I hope you're doing well. This is Charles Vallow from Arizona. We really enjoyed having you stay with us back in November when you came to the Preparing a People conference. I appreciated you taking the time to talk to me about the book I've been working on. Well, more than six months later, I still haven't made much progress on it, but I feel an urgency to get it done. As the managing partner of Right Planning Group, I'm going to have the opportunity to speak at various conventions beginning in the fall, but everyone says I need to have a book available that summarizes my life and shares the principles I follow. So I will cut to the chase. I'm willing to pay you to help me get this book into shape as my ghostwriter. I really liked your autobiography and the tone you took in sharing experiences without preaching. 
Is there any way you could come here for a couple days and help me get the book underway? I feel like talking in person would be much more valuable than a phone call or video chat, mainly because I would like you to read and through some of my journals and explain to me how the publishing industry works. It'll help me know whether I truly have a book in me and whether you want to team up on it. I played minor league baseball and have plenty of stories that my audience can relate to along with the knowledge I've gained running my own company. So I do feel the book would, be, would contain valuable information even beyond the convention circuit. I'm out of town until Saturday, but would gladly fly you down here early next week before the holiday and cover your expenses. You could stay in our guest room like before or in a hotel if you prefer. I hate to take you away from your family, but I know this book is vital to my speaking success. I understand if you don't want to take part in the project, but I would definitely make it worth your time with admiration, Charles. So why would Lori do that? Well, it was so Chad could show this email to his wife and have an excuse to fly up and be paid to see his head witch dry hump partner probable fuck buddy. But Lori's plan backfires. Charles Vallow discovers the email and is fucking livid. Immediately figuring out that Lori had written it, uh, Chad will show his, uh, uh, could show his wife, or excuse me, immediately figuring out that Lori had written fake emails Chad could show his wife to explain why he needed to go to you know, Arizona. Uh, the real Charles then wrote to Chad, Chad, I'm Lori's husband, but I gathered you already knew this. She sent an email yesterday, supposedly written by me, inviting you to Arizona next week and to ghost write a book I'm supposedly working on. It's preposterous. I am not paying anybody for anything, and I am not writing a book. Either you or Lori need to tell me what's going on, or this will be exposed for all to see. Regards, Charles Vallow. Oh, fuck yeah. He also discovered that Lori had sent videos to Chad of herself dancing, and so he wrote a follow-up. Does your wife know you have several of Lori's dance videos? Explain how that is in any way appropriate. I'm picturing these videos looking a lot like uh, Britney Spears' dance videos, by the way. Finally, Vallow demanded that Lori uh, come clean about her affair. When she didn't, he sent an email to Chad's wife, Tammy's uh, work address at Central Elementary in Sugar Creek, Idaho, where she worked as a librarian. Uh, I think I said Sugar Creek, Sugar City. Sugar City is just uh, five miles down the road from Rexburg. And he wrote, Tammy, my name is Charles Vallow. I have some vital and disturbing information regarding your husband and my wife, Lori. This is your work email, so I'll wait to send you the evidence that is very disturbing. You may call or email me from the address where you can receive the information. I apologize to be the one sending this, but something has to be done. I feel it's best if I shed some light on this issue. Regards, Charles Vallow. I love this, right? Charles seems to be handling all this with a lot of maturity. He has been placed into a horrifically stressful life situation, especially later in life. He's 62. Having somebody wreck your life like this doesn't leave you with the same amount of time to rebuild it if it happens when you're like 32. Yeah, it's terrible what's happened to Charles in the story. Over the next few weeks, this will all seriously take its toll on Charles. Of course it does. He sends Lori threats, begs her to talk to him, tells her that she has destroyed him, demands apologies. Nothing makes her budge. You sadly sometimes simply cannot reason with someone as deep into their magical thinking bullshit as Lori now is. By this point, I think she's past saving. I think she's so gone that no one is going to be able to pull her out of this insane echo chamber she has helped create, right? Maybe somebody could, maybe if they had her involuntarily committed to a psychiatric center for a long time, but probably not even then, right? She's not actually insane. She's just chosen to believe very destructive and twisted religious adjacent teachings. It's funny how one person can believe they can conjure vibrating fire and teleport and shit and get committed and diagnosed with schizophrenia and be helped with antipsychotic medicine and therapy, but another person can believe the same things but can't be committed because they don't have a brain that's chemically malfunctioning. They've just chosen to believe some seriously weird shit. I feel like this in many ways is worse, right? There's no medicine you can take to get rid of a terrible belief system. And when you're this committed to a destructive spiritual belief system, it, it's so hard to break somebody away from it through therapy as well. It would have been better for almost everyone in this story if Lori was simply just schizophrenic. In desperation, Charles finally reaches out to Adam Cox, right? The only one of Lori's siblings she's never fucked. <laughs> I mean, the only one that lived outside of their tight-knit fam tight family group. He told Adam everything he knew about Lori's bizarre belief system, the multiple probations, dark and light spirits, Ned Schneider begged him to help. Uh, probations, by the way, is just code for past lives. While the mainstream LDS church does not believe in reincarnation, some early LDS apostles like Heber Kimball did. And that belief has circulated in FLDS circles ever since. Adam was also worried about Lori, Lori and Alex. He agreed to fly to Arizona in early July and they could stage an intervention. But even, th but even then, Charles was not certain anything would snap her out of it. 
He texted Adam, she'll see it as an attack on her personally. She will blame everyone else for her problems. Yep. Uh, He added, we are evil. She is a God. She truly believes it. The biggest problem is that she's got a whole group of people that believe they are special, chosen, know what's going to happen. I'm not sure of the relationship with her and Chad Daybell, but they are up to something. I was the only one brave enough to try and get her help in January. And look what happened to me. The whole family put a scarlet letter on me. Maybe now they can see what they're up against. Uh, Indeed, much of the Cox family now hated Charles. Lori had successfully turned them against him, except for Adam. So they hatched a plan. Adam would record her sister or his sister talking about her beliefs, then play that recording for a leader in the LDS church. Hopefully Lori's community would come together and try and straighten her out. But on July 9th, Lori found out about this plan and concocted a new one of her own. Pretty dangerous one. Uh, She texted her niece, Melanie, the one who had been attending the crazy ass casting meetings, the daughter of her late sister, Stacy. Uh, Melanie considered her aunt to be like the mother she never had. And she had recently had a falling out with her father, Steve Cope, for raising her far away from the Coxes, uh, separating her from what he felt was a dangerous and strange family. Um, she had a falling out. I'm sorry with, uh, oh my gosh, her husband. I think I wrote dad there. So there's so many fucking people in the story. Uh, Melanie even looked like, uh, Lori wearing her hair in the same soft, uh, beachy blonde curls. No, it was her dad. Sorry. My God. Ah, Lori texted Melanie and told her to cancel her upcoming plans to attend a wedding in Utah. You can't go at all. We both need to stay there and defend ourselves, Lori texted. It's coming to a head. This week will change everything. And she texted Alex, making plans to keep Adam away from him, like she knew if Adam got to his brother, he could sway the influence she had over him. So she told him he could fuck her three times for real. No dry hump. Full full penetration. Uh, Brother P, sister V. She even role play and pretend to be their grandma, just like Alex preferred. I honestly wouldn't be shocked if that was true, but it's not. No, she texted him. I'm going to need you to stay close to me the next couple of days. Mel too. It's all coming to a head this week. I, I will be like Nephi, I am told, and so will you. Okay, so now it's a question of whose plan will prevail. Two days later, 7.37 a.m., Charles Vallow parks his rental car outside of the spacious brown home that he had rented for Lori, JJ, and Tylee. He'd offered to take the kids to school and was surprised to see Alec, Alex Cox's silver Ford backed up into the driveway. Al is here, Vallo texted Adam at Lori's. Uh, Adam responded that he thought his brother and sister were planning something. Absolutely, Vallo wrote back. Then Vallo knocked on the door. Almost an hour later, at 8.32 a.m., Alex Cox will call 911. By the time this call was placed, Charles Vallo was almost certainly already dead. I got in a fight with my brother-in-law and I shot him in self-defense, Alex said. Is he hurt? Is he alive? Yeah, there's blood. He's not moving, Alex said. How long ago did this happen? The dispatcher asked. A couple of minutes. Alex told another dispatcher that he had shot Charles in the chest and he was lying on the floor unconscious. They asked Cox to see if he was breathing, said he couldn't tell. He said he didn't know how to do CPR. He answered answered several more questions, telling the 911 operator where the gun was, what kind of gun he owned, what his name was, what his brother-in-law's name was. His breath stayed steady, even though he claimed he was doing chest compressions like the operator told him to do. He told the operators that the shooting had happened maybe five minutes before he dialed 911. Remember that number, five minutes. A dispatcher now asked, were you guys arguing when this happened? Yeah, Alex said, he came at me with a bat. The dispatchers told him to walk outside with his hands in the air when officers arrived past the palm trees and manicured hedges. No weapons on me, he called out to the Chandler, Chandler police officers arriving at the home. One told him to sit down on the curb and he did. The police would then ask Alex what had happened. Alex claimed that Vallow uh, had arrived to pick up the kids and gotten physical with Lori, who had then left. After Vallow wouldn't go away, Tylee came out with the bat and Vallow took the bat away from her. He told me not to fear. He told me not to interfere anymore with them or I'd pay. And then he came at me with a bat, he said. Vallow then allegedly slammed Alex across the back of the head. Alex now ran upstairs and got a gun. As Alex spoke, Lori pulled up to the house. She parked a crimson red SUV, Vallow's rental car across the street, then walked to the house and towards her brother, Tylee, trailing behind her. Uh, Officers told them to wait across the street. Alex continued his story, saying that he told Charles to stop, but Charles wouldn't. Why did Alex return to the scene? Uh, The officers wanted to know why didn't he stay in the bedroom and close the door. Alex said that uh, doing that didn't occur to him. I just went back in the living room and was like, what's your problem? I said, I want you to put the bat down. And he wouldn't do it. And he came at me with the bat again after he already hit me in the head. So I shot him to stop him. That was it. Later, investigative reports from the Chandler Police Department will contradict Alex's story about what happened in the house that morning. 
When Lori left the home with JJ and Tylee after the scuffle, Alex had described she took Charles' phone with her, and the officers presumed that Vallo had already been shot by the time she left. GPS data from the phone showed that she left the house at 7.49 a.m., just 12 minutes after Vallo had parked in front of the home. She then made three stops. A security camera captured her in the drive through of a nearby Burger King, where she bought a 10-piece chicken nugget, nine-piece chicken fries, Sprite, bottle of water, went to Walgreens, where she purchased flip-flops for herself and Tylee, then drove JJ to school and was back home at 8.48 a.m. Body cam footage of her shows her not upset in the least. If anything, she seems fucking giddy. Happy to know that zombie Charles, a.k.a. Hiplos, a.k.a. fucking Ned Schneider was dead. They shot him and Bubba Humps made sure he died from his wounds before calling the police. Alex Cox did not call 911 until 8.32. Uh, within five minutes of the shooting, my ass. Investigators presumed that Charles would have laid dead or dying for approximately 43 minutes before Alex called 911. And before he called, Alex uh, uh, did call his sister twice, right? Gave her the good news. And when investigators got there, they saw zero blood coming from Charles's body, which meant Alex had not done the chest compressions, as he'd claimed. Vallo had been shot in the chest, just as Alex said. He'd been shot twice, but one of those shots had exploded into his chest while he was lying on the floor, shot from above by someone standing over him execution style, like how a hitman would loom over somebody while they begged for mercy. Officers also suspicious of Lori's behavior. When investigators spoke to her outside the house, she barely reacted to the news. She smiled, at one point laughed nervously about what the neighbors must think. Did not look distraught at all. <clears throat> Excuse me, just the opposite. Looked giddy. She told him her story, which sort of matched Alex's. Said that Charles had loaded up JJ in the car, then came in, saw Lori holding his phone. The sight enraged him, and uh, he started yelling at her. She ran away when Tylee came down with the bat, went into mom mode, she said, loading her kids into the car, taking off for the school. She explained that Alex called her and asked if she had left to take JJ to school, and she said yes and told him to call 911. What investigators didn't know at the time was that Lori was already texting her friends excitedly that Hiplos is gone. The day of Vallo's death, Chad made a call to a local funeral home to inquire about the cost of cremation and transporting ashes to, to Louisiana. The audio of the call haunting in its mundaneness. We just had a death in the family. We really don't want to do anything but a cremation and to send the remains to the family in Louisiana. Is there any way to know a ballpark price on that? I'm sorry for your loss, the woman on the phone said. Okay, thank you. When she asked his name, he said, Chad Daybell. She asked him to spell it and he fucked up. D-A-B-A-L. <laughs> then he pronounced it slightly differently and claimed that it was his uncle, John Myron Daybell, or D-A-B-A-L, who had died. Uh-huh, clearly he's in on the murder too. Lori and Chad broke the news to the rest of the family. Like Charles' sons from his previous marriage, Lori informed them, then promptly stopped answering their text when they asked what happened to their fucking dad. She just like, yeah, your dad's dead. <laughs> Sorry, I know this is terrible news. And then they're like, what happened? They're trying to call her. Uh, how did he die? And she just doesn't get back to them for hours and hours and hours. Lori also broke the news to her son, Colby Ryan, who by then lived out of the house and was married with a child of his own. Charles was the most important father figure he'd ever had. And she told him that Charles died of a heart attack. That evening, he came to the house where Tylee met him at the door, threw her arms around her brother. She was trying to be okay, but she really wasn't, he told investigators. Also, he is shocked when Alex now informs him that Charles didn't die of a heart attack. No, Alex shot him. Uh, Lori now begs Colby to fly to Houston with her to clean out Charles's house. And after much resistance and anger and confusion over why she lied to him about the heart attack, he relented. And Houston, as Lori rifled through cabinets at Vallow's home, she remarked to her son that she was planning to get married again soon. Jesus, the fucking body's barely cold. Colby told her that seemed crazy and said it would be cruel to Tylee to introduce her to yet another father in her life so quickly, and that was the end of the conversation. Even though two of Lori's ex-husbands were now gone, she still felt beset by demonic forces. And now she worried those forces were taking over her kids. She felt Tylee had been dark for some time. She and Chad even referred to as referred to her as Hillary, the zombie fucking monster first lady thing. Now JJ was going dark too. She texted Zulema, dark spirits are attacking us daily. It is a constant battle. They are getting to me through JJ right now. Fight, fight, fight is all we do. Wish I had time for some fun stuff. Is JJ okay? Zulema wrote back. Is he being possessed? They keep trying, Lori said, but we keep fighting them off. It's constant though. Oh my God. She was also upset that Charles had changed his life insurance so that Lori was no longer the beneficiary. Something she found out about uh, after she inquired about it, uh, excuse me, something she found out after she inquired about it approximately two days after he died. 
fucking zombie demons won't even let her get paid. Also, there was one especially dark person who remained stubbornly alive, Chad's wife, Tammy. She had not died in a car accident, as Chad had predicted. But both he and Lori were still convinced that Tammy's time on Earth was growing shorter. Tammy is very close, exclamation point, Chad wrote shortly after Charles' death. They even gave her her own Ned Schneider type, you know, demon name, which I mentioned of Viola. Lori was now making plans to move to Rexburg, which put pressure on Chad to quickly change his living situation. And on August 10th, just a month after Charles' murder, JJ answers a video call from his grandparents. Uh, They wanted him to come to a memorial in Louisiana, but Lori would not let him, telling Kay Woodcock that they were moving to Hawaii before school starts and her consolation prize was a FaceTime. She's a fucking heartless monster. Uh, Wouldn't even be much of a FaceTime. As soon as the call connected, he spoke with his characteristic enthusiasm, JJ did, but after a few minutes... His eyes flicked away to something off screen and JJ said, I gotta go, bye. Mom clearly called him away. What a piece of shit. This call lasted for a grand total of 35 seconds and it would be the last time the Woodsox would see their grandson. By the middle of August, Lori was more frustrated than ever that she wasn't the only woman in Chad's life. Now a widow, she had to confront the reality that she was the other woman. She had no life insurance money, four ex-husbands, two children to care for and Chad's assurances that she was some sort of Messiah figure. She sent him a passive-aggressive text, essentially calling their relationship off until he decided to make up his mind, writing, Go have fun with your family. I really do want you to. I just, I can't be in the way anymore. If things change, we can talk. But we have nothing until things change anyway. Several days later, things had clearly changed after a talk with Chad. Lori placed an order for two simple wedding bands on Etsy. And on the last day of August 2019, Lori drove with JJ and Tylee towards a townhouse on Pioneer Road in Rexburg that would be their new home. She called the house Zion in text messages. At the house, she would be alone with her children. Nobody to doubt her. Nobody to tell her no. If anybody asks about me or where I moved, you can just say I moved in with my brother, she texted Zulema, especially those who seek my destruction. By that, she said she meant Serena Sharp and Christina Atwood now. Melanie Baudreau and Alex Cox also moved north to Rexburg, occupying two other townhouses on Pioneer Road. Alex texted Zulema that the move had been pretty good considering the dark portal we brought with us. And who was this dark portal? Tylee. By September, Lori is more paranoid than ever. She believed that someone from the Cox family was out to kill her and that she needed Bubba Humps to protect her. Her brother Adam, in particular, she said, was a zombie. But all was not darkness. She made time to take her kids to Yellowstone on September 8th, snapping uh, selfies by waterfalls and geysers. JJ and Tylee smiling, hugging for photos, looking happy. These will be the last photos of these poor kids ever taken while they're alive. Uh, Alex was there too, also looking happy. They dined at Buckaroo Bills in West Yellowstone, then drove back to Rexburg, arriving at 8.37 p.m. An hour later, Alex ran out to the local Maverick gas station, just a few blocks away, returned to his sister's, where he remained until 11.15 p.m., at which point he walked across the grass, over to the next row of townhouses, unlocked the door to 107 and went inside. Late that night, 2.42 a.m., Alex phone pings. He's back inside his sister's townhouse, and he stays there for another hour and a half, very likely killing Tylee. 4.37 a.m., he walks through the darkness back home again. Odd, right? September 10th, 2019, uh, the next day, at 9.21 a.m., Alex Cox's phone pings in Chad Dable's backyard near the fire pit and near an area Chad's family used to bury pets. He was there for about two hours. His phone continually pinging, 1039, 1047, 1057. And then just a few minutes after Alex left, Chad Daybell texted his wife, Tammy, who was at work about eight minutes away. Well, I've had an interesting morning, he wrote. I felt I should burn all of the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the coming storms. While I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery, fun times. Uh, Investigators will later believe he is talking about Tylee here, not a raccoon. Tammy didn't respond. Gonna shower now and go right for a while at BYU. Love you, Chad added. Meanwhile, Alex steered his truck back towards Rexburg. Went to Del Taco for a burrito. A man man gets hungry. Digging a grave for the niece, right? He's just buried. The niece he's almost certainly murdered and then buried. Uh, Two weeks later, Melanie Gibb and her boyfriend, David Warwick, visited Lori for another wackadoodle. Uh, How do all these fucking idiots have the money and time to waste on all this bullshit conference? in Rexburg. Lori told him that Tylee wasn't around because, you know, she'd been killed by Bubba Humps at her request. I mean, was enrolled as a student at nearby BYU-Idaho. But JJ was around, being his normal, goofy, seven-year-old self. On the evening of Sunday, September 22nd, Warwick and Gibb 
were sitting with Lori in her kitchen, recording an episode of their Feel the Fire podcast, when Alex Cox slowly opened the front door of the townhouse. JJ was asleep in Alex's arms when he came into the house, and Alex tiptoed upstairs with JJ, putting the boy to bed in Lori's bedroom. Or maybe not putting him to bed because he was already dead. And Lori knew that and didn't stop giggling, and that didn't stop her, excuse me, from giggling and chatting on her shitty podcast. In the middle of the night, after everyone had gone to bed, Melanie and David woke up. Uh, David had a bad dream. They decided to wake up Lori for a blessing. But when Melanie knocked on Lori's door, nobody answered. Huh. Chad didn't pick up his phone either. The next morning, Lori was in the kitchen visiting uh, or venting to her friends about how JJ had officially now become a zombie. JJ had always been immensely strong, she said, but now he crawled up onto the kitchen counter, boosted himself on top of the fridge and knocked a frame photo or painting of Jesus <laughs> photo. A frame photo of Jesus. She had a photo of Jesus. They knocked on the floor. Uh, and that was the last straw. Lori told Melanie she was thinking of calling Kay Woodcock, JJ's grandma, asking her to take JJ off his hands once for all. She thought maybe she could make up a story. You know, uh, Lori would say she's sick, has breast cancer, and just couldn't care for the boy anymore. So fucked. She's having too much fun with Chad and all their delusions. Taking care of her son just does not interest her anymore. Uh, she said she could meet Kay in an airport and hand off JJ. It would be easy. She knew Kay would uh, do absolutely anything to be with him. Melanie encouraged her to do it. Friends said goodbye. Melanie and David departed. It's thought she told Melanie all this after JJ was likely dead. Also, her friends had a good reason for JJ, you know, not being around anymore. That morning, 9.55 a.m., Alex Cox's phone is back at the Daybell property underneath a tree at the pond, back by the pet cemetery, a fucking dead giveaway that another body is being buried. Also that day, two photographs uploaded to Lori's iCloud account from a gun store. Two snapshots of boxes of rifle ammunition. Uh, uh, yeah. September 24th, Lori calls staff at Kennedy Elementary saying that she was withdrawing her son. And no one will see JJ alive again. Week later, October, Lori, uh, in October, Lori began renting a 10 by 10 foot store unit, storage unit at Self Storage Plus. Sorry, my mouth is working less well than normal today. October 2nd, around 2.25 p.m., she pulled up with Chad. He got out, pulled a spare tire from the trunk, rolled it along the cement hallway into the storage locker. Together, they hefted a car, car bench seat inside, the kind that would make up an entire back row of seating in an SUV, SUV of reasonable size. As they left, Chad ran his hand down her back and across the seat of her buttocks. Uh, the next day, Lori was back at Storage Plus with Alex, who carried the tire and the seat outside of the car without her help. Probably just getting rid of evidence right here. Her brother returned to the storage unit throughout the month. Once he came with someone who looked like Chad and the two men wheeled scooters and bicycles, real bikes, uh, not ladies, including one with training wheels inside. They carried in boxes of photo albums and handmade blankets with photographs that JJ and Tylee stitched onto them. Uh, Lori's earlier Etsy order for wedding bands had been canceled and so she placed a new order on Amazon using Charles Vallow's account. A cheap, simple silver wedding, silver wedding band inlaid with bright green malachite. Meanwhile, Chad logged on to Avow where he discussed an article with the site's moderator, Christopher Perrett, uh, that had posted from, been posted from a blog called Natural News, a well-known conspiracy site titled The Collapse Will Be Local. Former military intelligence, special forces veterans explain why your proximity to left-wing cities may determine your fate. In it, he argued that left-wing activists would be the source of America's looming civil war and labeled them all zombies. Excellent article, Chris. Chad wrote, if the liberals head towards Rexburg, though, do we just shoot the zombies as they approach the Yukon overpass on Highway 20? Fuck. Around the same time, somebody tries to shoot Brandon Bordreau, Melanie Bordreau's estranged, estranged husband from a green Jeep in a drive-by shooting. Brandon's window shatters and the car takes off. Luckily, they had missed. He had an idea of who shot at him, though. Melanie was the only person who had known where he had moved to coordinate drop-offs with the kids. Had she told Lori, Chad, and most importantly, Alex, the sister-humping uh, hitman, where he lived. Wasn't lost on Brandon that Melanie was the beneficiary of his life insurance policy. Probably time to change that shit up. A few days later, on October 9th, Chad's wife, librarian Tammy Daybell, is returning home from a meeting of the Relief Society an LDS women's organization where she had been prepping freezer meals. She pulled her car into the driveway under the large golden house numbers, uh, got out. And as she was unpacking the back seat, sees a dude standing near the back of her car as if he'd been waiting for her to get home. He has a paintball gun and is wearing a ski mask. Tammy screams, yells for Chad, who was inside the house. The man in black flees running around the side of the brick house and across the backyard. 
Tammy calls the police, also makes a post on Facebook in case anyone else had seen him. Okay, neighbors, she wrote, something really weird just happened and I want you to know so you can watch out. I had gotten home and parked in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask was suddenly standing by the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran off around the back of my house. I have no idea what his motive was and he never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he thought he was doing. I was about to smack him with my freezer meals from enrichment tonight when I decided to yell for Chad instead. It is thought this masked man was Alex Cox, right? Bubba, Bubba Humps, lover and a fighter. It's thought that uh, Chad had this all set up so that when he later kills his wife, uh, you know, it can make it seem like this masked man must have done it. And just 10 days later, October 19th, Tammy is found dead in her bed. She's 49. The Daybell's eldest son, Garth, was sleeping when he heard a loud thump in his parents' bedroom. Then he heard his dad, Chad, start to shout. He leapt out of bed, ran into his parents' bedroom where he saw his mother lying half in the bed, half out of it, and he pulled her back onto the bed. I think she's dead, he told his dad, who was wandering around the room now saying stuff like, why, how could this happen? All right, doing some shitty acting. When the coroner arrived, the Daybell family declined an autopsy. The coroner, coroner will later declare that she died of natural causes. But you know that didn't happen. Chad said that Tammy had been going to bed earlier and earlier each night recently, grasp, gasping for breath with some kind of cold. The news shocked Tammy's family in Utah, right? She had visited only weeks before and seemed to be in great shape, very healthy, the best shape of her life, eagerly taking Zumba and clogging classes. Chad, <laughs> clogging. Chad would get a life insurance payout of $430,000. Tammy was buried back in Springville, Utah. Her family was weirded out that a bunch of Chad's strange contacts from his publishing company kept showing up. One guy even handing out fucking business cards during her burial. After the funeral, Chad takes his younger brother Brad aside and uh, hints that he may remarry very soon. Chad tells his brother about a woman he'd recently met. Uh Uh-huh. A widow who owned homes in Hawaii and Arizona and Idaho. This was shocking to Brad, who thought his brother would be a hermit. And also, his wife had just died a few fucking days ago. Chad said he wouldn't even wait six months to get married. Turns out Chad wouldn't even wait one month. Chad and Lori get married in Hawaii, wearing bright white clothes and purple orchids around their necks November 5th, 2019. No, uh, not, not much of a period of mourning for their spouses. Neither one seemed upset that both Tylee and JJ uh, are fucking dead. To most of the rest of the world, they're not even uh, considered missing yet. There were no friends, no family at the secret beach wedding. Days after the wedding, the pair inquires at the Kauai Beach Resort about renting a house. Uh, they say they have no children with them. When they head back to the mainland, they break the news that they are married to Chad's five grown children, who I'm sure were thrilled. November 26, a pair of police detectives are now dispatched to a townhouse on Pioneer Road. They want an answer to one question. Where the fuck is JJ? Where is the seven-year-old boy with the wide, toothy grin and the laugh that shook his whole body? Nobody could say how long he'd been missing for. Days, weeks, months. He had to be somewhere, they thought. Excuse me. As they made their way through the Rock Creek Hollow community, the detectives passed houses in the same muted beige tone with the same faux brick facades, same tightly clipped sections of green lawn. There were a couple decorations out since it was two days before Thanksgiving, bundles of dried corn stalks and pumpkins. The Vallow family lived in Unit Unit 175. Detectives knew that they hadn't been there long since they'd come out of uh, state to live in the remote town of 28,000. Detectives just didn't know why they'd come. They knocked on the door, expecting Lori Vallow to answer, but instead, two men come to the door. One is Alex Cox, right? Uh, Lori's brother. They didn't know that Lori thought of Alex as her protector, her guardian angel, her backup orgasm provider when there's no one else around to passionately dry hump. Other man is Chad Daybell. Detective Ray Hermosillo Hermosillo, asked the two men if J.J. Vallow was at home. Neither man said a word for a few moments. Uh, Alex then looked at Chad, said that his nephew was out of town, visiting his grandma in Louisiana. But Hermosillo knew that wasn't true. In fact, Kay Woodcock had called the police out of desperation to track down her grandson. She had no idea where he was, uh, you know, where he was and where Lori was. Hermosillo now asked the men for Lori Vallow's phone number, but they both said they didn't have it. Instead, Alex pointed to a row of townhouses, uh, you know, uh, another row of them, Unit 107, where he said they thought Lori might be. Detective Dave Hope now made his way to that townhouse. As he did, he noticed Chad Daybell driving away in a black Chevy Equinox. Hermosillo waved him down, asked him about the last time he saw JJ. Chad told the detective that he had seen the boy in Unit 107 in October, one month prior. Hermosillo asked him for Lori's phone number, but once again, Chad claimed he didn't have it. Said he didn't really know her. They'd only met a couple times. It's not like they were were married or something. 
Detective Ray Hermosillo also knew that wasn't true. He knew that Chad was, in fact, Lori's new husband. So why is this fucker lying? Right? JJ's disappearance suddenly seems very, very bad. Something's happened to him. Hermosillo pressed for Lori's phone number. Chad finally caves, but not before adding that he felt the police were accusing him of something. Hermosillo now lets uh, the man go on his way, but obviously he is very suspicious of him. Detective takes his phone out of his pocket, calls the station. Meanwhile, nobody had answered Detective Hope's knocks at Unit 107. When he returned to 175, Alex is not answering the door there either. On the phone, Hermosillo spoke to his lieutenant who instructed him to go directly to the Madison County Prosecutor's Office, get a fucking search warrant. Later that morning, new pair of detectives would arrive at the doorstep of Lori's beige townhouse, Detective Dave Stubbs and Lieutenant Ron Ball. This time, Lori answers the door cheerily, invites him to come on inside. Detectives notice that at 46 years old, Lori still looks the part of the beauty queen and cheerleader she had been, at a, been as a young woman. Dreamy blonde curls, sparkling blue eyes, brilliant white smile, athletic figure. As Lori showed the men inside, she told the detectives that she just hung up the phone with Detective Hope, who had called asking about the whereabouts of her son. This is a big mess, she told him. So JJ would be where? Ball asked. Uh, he's with one of my friends in Arizona, my friend Melanie. Her son has autism, she explained. Lori told him that JJ was also diagnosed as autistic, and before the family had moved north to Idaho, he had been enrolled at a school for children with special needs. For a while, he had his own trained service dog, a curly black golden doodle named Bailey. Lieutenant Ball explained that they were still concerned, as neither Chad nor Alex knew anything about this. What was going on? She told him, annoyance at the edge of her voice, it's because a lot of stuff has gone on, if you want to know. That's why we're concerned, Stubbs said. Lori agreed. It is very weird. I've had to move around a lot. One of my brothers is trying to kill me. She claimed her other brother, Adam Cox, had been colluding with her estranged husband to kill her in order to collect her multi-million dollar life insurance policy, and he had recently arrived in Rexburg menacing and threatening her. It's been a horrible year for us. I've had to move around, she said. They had only recently arrived in Rexburg from Arizona, and Lori had enrolled JJ at a public school a little over a mile away. But really, nothing was going right, and she was making plans already to move back to Arizona so her son could re-enroll in his old school with his old teachers in that familiar place. The move to Idaho wasn't what she hoped for. As she spoke, it seemed like Lori truly had nothing to hide. She just kept talking, unspooling a strange story in which she was a harrowed single mother trying to keep her children safe from threats. Also seemed clear from what Lori was saying that she and Kay were not on good terms. Lori told the Rexburg detectives that Woodcock threatened her in emails and had given her the sense that she was trying to build some kind of case against her, even though she had been the one slighted when Charles died because he had left all his money to Kay and not Lori. Lori then started talking about her daughter, Tylee. She said she'd moved so that Tylee could attend BYU-Idaho just up the hill. The detectives were by this time very puzzled. The last question they had was about Chad. What was his last name? Daybell. Lori answered, doesn't he live like out in the, wait, isn't that the Chad Daybell that uh, Lieutenant Ball stumbled over his words? Uh, didn't his wife pass away recently? I think so, she said. Minutes later, Stubbs and Ball knocked once more on the door saying they were just needed one more thing, the number of Melanie Gibb, so they could locate JJ. In the confusion of Lori's rambling story, they'd almost forgotten their real reason for coming. She said she'd have Melanie call them and give them and gave them her phone number. Uh, the detectives thanked her, said goodbye, and went on their way. Meanwhile, Chad Daybell now called Melanie Gibb, right? Lori's friend from Arizona warned her that the Rexburg police would be calling and asking about JJ. If her phone rang, he said, just don't pick up. Not suspicious at all. Melanie felt sidelined, confused. Why exactly were the police calling her? What was going on? Where was JJ? Weeks earlier, Lori had told Melanie she'd handed JJ off to Kay Woodcock at an airport. That whole fake breast cancer story. Now on the phone with Chad, Melanie asked for details about JJ's whereabouts, but he had no answers. He only emphasized that she must not pick up the phone. Melanie did not understand, but still said she'd do what he asked. And when the police called, initially Melanie did not answer. The detectives then called authorities in Gilbert, Arizona, where Melanie lived. When an officer from the Gilbert Police Department phoned Melanie later, she did answer. And she lied to them, claiming the boy had been with her, but she had since given him back to his mom, Lori. Melanie fabricated a story about the whereabouts of a seven-year-old boy and had no fucking idea why she was even doing so. So many terrible decisions being made in this suck by so many strange people. Such a soap opera. A couple hours later, Lori called Melanie, sounding cheerful and upbeat. She also wouldn't answer Melanie's questions about JJ. Instead, she asked Melanie to go somewhere where there were children running around and just, you know, snap a photo. Melanie would not do that, though. She wanted out of this mess. She's worried about JJ. 
The next morning, November 27th, when no law enforcement officer in either Idaho or Arizona had yet located JJ, Detective Hermosillo returned to the beige townhome community, this time with search warrants for 107, 175, and 174, where Lori's knee slipped. Once inside, he found all three unoccupied. In 107, where it turned out Alex Cox had lived, the police found several guns and little else. Their concern for JJ amplifies. In 175, where Lori had told her story of persecution to the police the day before, Hermosillo found food in the refrigerator, cans and boxes of cereal in the pantry, and the beds were made up with sheets. A half bottle of pills with JJ's name on the label sat on the kitchen counter. Prescription Risperidone, which can treat irrit- irritability associated with autism. <clears throat> there were toys, excuse me, a framed, uh, <laughs> a framed picture of Jesus Christ. I almost said photo again. They had a photo, they had a photo of Jesus uh, on top of the refri- refrigerator. A mess, a mess of unoccupied hangers dangled from the rods in empty closets. The dresser drawers were empty. They had no idea where Lori was. Now Melanie begins to get real worried. She hasn't spoken to Lori or Chad for two weeks. So on December 8th, she decides to call him up and to record the call. Finally, finally someone other than Charles Vallow acting smart in the story. Hail Nimrod. Immediately, Chad's voice comes through the receiver. Hello, sweet Melanie. Hi, Chad. Hey, Lori. Melanie said, trying to sound upbeat. How are you guys? We're okay, Lori said. How are you doing, babe? I'm doing pretty good, thanks. I was wondering, where are you guys? We're just hanging out, Chad said, and then let a little giggle burst forward. Yeah, are you in Idaho? We're nowhere near Idaho, he responded, then chuckled again. (laughs) It's all so funny. It's so fucking funny how the kids and your wife are dead. Melanie asked, I just wanted to ask you a question, if you don't mind, Lori. Yeah, of course, honey. Melanie asked why Lori had told her that JJ was at Kay Kay Woodcock's house in Louisiana. Lori paused before answering. Well, I had to move him somewhere else because of her actions, she said. Melanie was still confused. Had Kay Woodcock tried to take JJ away from Lori? Melanie followed up. When I asked Chad the other day, I was like, hey, um, where's JJ? And he said, for my security, he didn't want me to know. So is there a reason I should be in danger to know where he is? No, Lori said, it's the danger that there's people after me. Chad chimed in. We thought that if you knew that put you in danger. Well, just in a bad position, Lori clarified. Yeah, in a bad position, Chad affirmed. Everybody, if they don't know anything, then they don't have to say they know, Lori said in a sing song, <laughs> sing song to her voice. I'm just trying to keep him protected. Melanie thought she detected a sneer in Lori's voice now. And keep you protected, Chad said to Melanie. She asked why Lori told the police that JJ was in Arizona. I just needed to use somebody, Lori stuttered. So I, I, I wouldn't have to tell them where he really was because they were going to tell Kay where he is. Is JJ safe? Melanie asked. He is safe and happy. Lori said. Melanie wanted to know why then were Lori and Chad being so secretive. I'm just not telling anybody so that nobody has to say where he is or get questioned where he is so I can keep him safe as as possible. Lori said, now sounding annoyed. Melanie kept pressing. Why had Alex told her that she did not want to know where JJ was? Why did he say JJ could not be found? What did that mean? Lori repeated herself. If no one knows, no one can tell where he was. Melanie had one more question. How long are you going to be away for? Like, are you ever going to be able to come out and come back to society again? I will do whatever the Lord needs me to do every day, Lori said. For fuck's sake. For the rest of the call, Lori alludes to people uh, working with the police who are after her. Darkness is knocking on the door all the time because that's the way dark works with the light. And I promise you that I've done nothing wrong in this case, Lori says at one point. Then Lori starts heaping on the flattery, saying she loves Melanie so much. If you really love me, Melanie replied, you tell me where JJ is. Not tell the police that I had him. I do, Lori said. And I did exactly what I felt the Lord was instructing me to do. And I appreciate you and I love you. And I would never do anything to harm you. Now Melanie pulls out the big guns. I believe that you have been very deceived by Satan, Melanie says. You know me, Mel. You know me, Lori urged. This does not sound like you. This sounds like you've been influenced by somebody dark who wants you to believe dark things and have fear of the celestial world. Of course. So predictable. Anyone who confronts these fuckheads about anything, they're only doing it because of Satan. Stand for Christ when he comes again, Lori offers, and he's coming soon. And we will all stand there and you will know at that point that he is supporting me and has supported me the whole time and I have not been deceived. The conversation wound down and Lori offered one last pronouncement. And for your own safety, I wish you didn't have as much knowledge as you have, as you will be accountable for the knowledge you do have, Mel. She sounded furious and also eerily calm. What the fuck is going on, right? 
Meanwhile, 6.30 a.m. December 11th, Tammy's body quietly exhumed and an autopsy is performed. She'll be back in the ground by 2.30 p.m. The findings will not be made public for years. But I think you know what they found, that uh, she was murdered. December 11th, 2019, Alex Cox wakes up to his new normal. The plan had been for him to stay in Rexburg, but instead he'd moved to Arizona and was living with Zulema, with whom he had started a relationship. Uh, They actually got married two weeks earlier on November 29th at a Chapel of Love in Las Vegas. Alex changed his name and the marriage certificate to Alex Pastenis. The marriage, according to the security guard present, seemed odd and cold, like it was just business. Melanie Bordreau got married in Las Vegas the following day, married a man named Ian Paola, uh, Paloski. Paloski, she'd been dating for less than two weeks. The only witness at the ceremony was Alex. Another cold ceremony. More business. Part of Chad's visions, perhaps. After the wedding, Zulema complained that the long drive had been rough on her back and Alex offered to give her a massage. And for some strange reason, she recalled later, he said we needed to find a Walmart because he wanted to buy this big, huge piece of plastic to put on the bed so the oil wouldn't get on the bed. But it was one of those you put on the floor when you paint. In the room, Alex spread this painting drop cloth on the bed, told Zulema to lie on top of it. Zulema fell asleep during the massage. When she woke up, she heard Alex talking on the phone to someone who she thought was either Lori or Chad. And later she would wonder if that was supposed to be her last day, if the drop cloth had been to hold her dead body and keep things from getting too messy. But the night passed without any incident, and they settled into their routine. Mostly, Alex seemed to just hang out around the house, creeping out Zulema's kids. But then the next morning, December 12th, he collapsed in the bathroom. Couldn't seem to get enough air. Zulema's son called 911, trying not to gag from the smell in the room where Alex had just defecated. Uh, Then soon, he lost consciousness. By the time he got to the hospital, he was dead. He had shit himself to death. And you know what? Good. I fucking love it. It's rare, but it happens. He pushed too hard, way too hard. And he shit out his entire large intestine, spleen, and most damaging, he shit out his spirit. A coroner would later determine that he got snagged for a second on his scrot, but then he kept pushing and he shit his soul completely out of his body. And that's how he died. Or had a blood clot in his lung. Or that's what for sure happened. After his death, when Alex became a key suspect in the deaths of J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan, his nephew and niece, Gilbert police would re-examine the circumstances around his sudden demise and reach the conclusion that he did die from natural causes. Died of natural causes at the age of 51 after almost certainly murdering at least three people. In mid-December 2019, the Rexburg PD announces to the public that two children were officially missing, JJ and Tylee, and nobody knew where Lori and Chad were. Actually, a couple people knew. Jack and Sheila Daybell, along with Brad Daybell, Chad's younger brother. They knew that Chad and his wife were living it up in Hawaii, far away from a massive police hunt. They spoke on the phone almost every day, Jack urging Chad to let him help with all this mess, but Chad kept turning him down. Finally, in late January, January, the story broke, kind of. Word got out that the couple had never been hiding in a dusty remote bunker surrounded by canned food and an arsenal of guns. In fact, they had been hiding in the exact opposite, a 1,700-square-foot condominium in Princeville, Kauai, with three bedrooms and a view of a resort golf course. February 20th, 2020, police arrest Lori in Hawaii and will extradite her to Idaho soon. Hail Nimrod! She's finally getting fucking caught! She faces charges in Madison County, Idaho, including two felony counts of desertion and non-support of dependent children, as well as three misdemeanors. Her bail is set at $5 million in Hawaii, and then once she's transferred to Idaho, it'll be $1 million. May, in May, Lori will appear in court in Rexburg to further uh, request a further reduction of her bail, which is denied, because she rarely attended her virtual court hearings, live streamed to the world because of COVID. Uh, for more than a year, Lori Vallow remained out of sight. Out of reach of the cameras, Lori faded into the beige nothingness of the Madison County Jail in downtown Rexburg. She lived in a cell smushed between a law office, <laughs> and I love this, and an O'Reilly auto parts store. Oh, 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 O'Reilly auto parts. Fucking just right next to that is Lori, <laughs> is Lori Vallow. She gave no interviews with JJ and Tylee still missing. It was looking a bit like she might escape murder charges, but then something blows the case wide open. Seven o'clock. The morning of June 9th, 2020, detectives arrive at the Daybell residence in Salem, Idaho. They had something important to warrant to search the home. The home had been purchased five years before, right? A tan brick house, 1,600 square feet, broken up into four bedrooms and a couple common areas. Front yard had a rope swing. On the day the detectives arrived, it was blowing in the breeze. Out back was a red barn. Not a commercial barn, but enough space to, you know, have a few animals, grow some corn and a lot out back and sustain a family for a little while. There was a chicken hutch, a fire pit, a small pond. Chad was there, 
He stepped away from detectives and waited in his silver SUV. Around 11 a.m., his cell phone rang a call from an inmate at the Madison County Jail in downtown Rexburg. It was his wife. Hi, babe. Lori chirped. Hi, Lori. Are you okay? They're searching the property. He told her as he kept looking over his shoulder toward the field, toward the pond, toward the fire pit. The house right now? Yeah. Are they seizing stuff again? They're searching, he said. So we'll see what transpires. What do you want me to do? Pray, Chad told her. They both knew the call was being recorded. I love you so much. I love you. Should I try and call you later, Lori asked? You can try, he said. I'll answer if I can. Okay. I love you. And I'll talk soon. Okay, baby. Lori said, I love you. Outside the silver SUV, cadaver dogs sniffed the earth intently, focusing in on the area around the rickety old barn. There was a four foot by two foot area of freshly laid sod that seemed to interest them. When officers rolled back the sod, they revealed large flat stones lying side by side. Under the stones, planks of wood and an odor. Rexburg Police Detective Ray Hermosillo, had been on the force for 19 years at this point, had responded to enough fatalities to recognize the unmistakable smell of a decomposing human corpse. The smell, a dead giveaway that a body is near. Dead giveaway. Dead giveaway. My neighbor got big testicles because we see this do it every day. Every day. Uh, the officers dug and dug at the earth until they exposed the shiny surface of a black plastic garbage bag. When they cut it open, they revealed the crown of a small head covered in light brown hair. And it's JJ. Wearing red pajamas, still wearing black socks. His body had been wrapped in layers and layers of duct tape. His hands stuck together like he was praying. A bag had been placed over his head. Immediately, Chad started his car and tried speeding away down North 1900 East. A dead giveaway. He was guilty. Now I'm not going to torture you. Uh, with that earworm again, earworm again, so soon after just playing it. I, I don't want you to think that me saying dead giveaway is a dead giveaway. Then I'm going to play some dead giveaway. Every day. Sorry, not sorry. Uh, Chatty Doomsday Daddy's escape attempt is a fruitless one. Officers had closed the road and roads in every direction. They quickly pulled him over and arrested him. In a gray polo shirt, jeans, and a baseball hat, hands cuffed behind him, Chad walked, resigned, towards a police cruiser, which would take him to be booked in the nearby Fremont County Jail, which was near a uh, Napa auto parts store. No, I don't know what auto parts have to do with that jail. Uh, he'd been arrested for obstruction or concealment of evidence and later charged with felony murder. His bail set at a million dollars next day. Back at the property, cadaver dogs pick up another scent near the fire pit. A neighbor had told police that the Daybell family had held several large bonfires the previous fall. When investigators began digging there, they found the bones of a long-dead cat and a dog. Then they unearthed what Hermosillo would describe in a courtroom as a mass of burnt flesh and bone and a melted green bucket filled with even more scorched flesh. Underneath it all lay a partial human skull. It was the remains of 16-year-old Tylee Ryan completely unrecognizable. She'd been torn apart and charred to bits. June 10th, 2020, the Woodcock and Ryan families confirm that the human remains found on Chad's property are those of Tylee and JJ. This finding officially confirmed by Rexburg Police June 13th. July 2nd, prosecutors dropped two charges against Lori related to desertion and non-supportive dependent children and instead charged her with obstruction or concealment of evidence regarding her children's remains. July 17th, in light of the two felony counts against Lori having been dropped, her bond is actually lowered by Madison County Judge Michelle Mallard. Bond set at 50000 for each charge, totaling one hundred and fifty grand. Luckily, still too much for her to post. She is now out of friends who can help her. Almost everyone but Chad is a dirty, no-good zombie, and he's behind bars too. It was further noted that Chad would still need to post a million dollars in Fremont County to be released from jail. Lori's trial date is set for January 25th to the 29th, 2021, but almost a year later, her charges will change again, and so will Chad's. May 25th, 2021, Chad and Lori now indicted on charges of conspiracy to commit first-degree murder and grand theft by deception for the deaths of Tylee, JJ, and Tammy. Lori also charged with grand theft related to Social Security survivor benefits. Chad faced an insurance fraud charge related to a life insurance policy he had on Tammy for which he was the beneficiary and received funds after her death. Two days later, Lori is found incompetent and unfit to stand trial, and her case is stayed. In 2020, or excuse me, 2022, She'll be deemed competent to stand trial after months of mental health treatment, then deemed incompetent again, then again deemed competent. Apparently, her results showed that she suffered from hyper-religiosity and an unspecified personality disorder with histrionic and narcissistic features. I forgot that hyper-religiosity is actually classified. 
by the DSM-5 as a psychiatric disturbance defined as experiencing intense religious beliefs or episodes that interfere with normal social and work functioning. It's often associated with abnormal brain functioning and other psychotic disorders, but not always. Lori, from what I can tell, doesn't have these other issues, just chose to adhere to a very shitty belief system. Let's fast forward two years. May 12, 2023, Lori Vallow found guilty, Lori Vallow Daybell, found guilty of all criminal charges against her in the Boise, Idaho courtroom. At the trial, Tammy Daybell's autopsy results were officially revealed she had died of asphyxiation by someone else, aka she was fucking strangled in bed and while she was in bed with chat. Before Lori's sentencing, Lori addressed the court for almost 10 minutes with so much fucking crazy, claiming, just like Chad, that a near-death experience allowed her to communicate with the spirit world. Her mental health treatment did nothing to help her. She still believes all the same shit, still thinks that, you know, everything she did, all of it, all part of God's plan for her, and that she would still have a major role and be rewarded for all she's been through in the end times. I have a feeling she will grow old and die in prison, never wavering in this belief. She told the judge that she knew for a fact that her children and Tammy Daybell were happy in heaven. Actually, is saying this in court. Tylee and Josh, uh, Joshua, you know, JJ had communicated with her that they're happy after their deaths. Jesus knows me and Jesus understands me, she said. I mourn with all of you who mourn my children and Tammy. Jesus Christ knows the truth of what happened here. Jesus Christ knows no one was murdered in this case. <laughs> Jesus knows that you're supposed to kill your kids sometimes when they get zombified, duh. Uh, Judge Boyce will will reply, after all of this evidence in trial, you haven't shown any remorse. You haven't said you're sorry. You haven't done anything to seek leniency from this court. Prosecutors read a statement Monday written by her oldest child, Colby, who said that his mom's actions have kept him from being able to share his life with the people he loves the most. My children will never know their uncle, their aunt, or grandfather, or even their grandmother, he said in the statement. Tylee and JJ brought so much light into this world. With their lives stolen, I'd like to share this. I believe nothing could or ever will be the same. July 31st, 2023, Lori sentenced to consecutive life sentences for respectively the murder of Tylee, the murder of JJ, and the conspiracy to commit murder charge of Tammy, in addition to fines and restitution for grand theft charges. There is no chance she will ever get out of prison. Uh, You know, unless, of course, she can figure out her witch teleportation stuff and open up a fucking light worker wizard portal in her cell, uh, which I'm guessing she believes is possible. Maybe first take out the zombie COs with level six vibrating fire. Larry Woodcock spoke to reporters following the sentencing, did not speak highly of Lori's statement in court. He said, that was a bucket of shit. Sure was, Larry. Nailed it. Lori still needs to face uh, additional criminal charges in Arizona. As of October 2023, a judge had signed over her extradition to face charges related to the death of Charles Vallow and the attempted hit on Brandon Boudreau. Or Boudreau. And what about Chad Daybell? He faces six charges, all related to the murders of Tammy, JJ, and Tylee. A jury will not hear Chad's case until 2024. The judge in the case, Judge Stephen Boyce, set the trial date for April 1st at the Ada County Courthouse in Boise. As of this recording, he could still face the death penalty the judge has not decided. Chad's five adult children have come to their father's defense and told 48 hours they're convinced of his innocence. How unfortunate. He has clearly still manipulated them. They are brainwashed. Sad he can't just come clean. But I guess if he was arrogant and delusional enough to think that he's God's most important person on earth, you know, he's also arrogant and delusional enough to think he's uh, maybe not going to die in prison. His kids believe the way JJ and Tylee were found buried shallowly suggests their father, former grave digger, was not involved and would have been smart enough not to bury the bodies on his own property. He was framed. This is his property. If there's bodies buried here, it would be attributed to him, said Emma Murray, his eldest daughter. Emma, your dad's a fucking monster. Sooner you can come to terms with that, sooner you can say, uh, you know, goodbye and start to heal. It's fucking obvious to the rest of the world that he killed your mom. Smothered her in her bed as she lay asleep next to him. And he wanted, you know, uh, his side pieces, kids dead and out of the way so he could be done with dry humping and, you know, fuck a hot woman who worshipped him and shared his delusions all the time. I hope he ends up on death row. I guess we'll see in just a matter of months. And that is it for this uh, monstrous timeline. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell. There will be more to their stories, but man, we still had uh, plenty to uh, plenty to tell a tale today, right? I think it's probably the longest episode we've done. Uh, I really tried to edit everything down to something closer to two hours, but uh, I just couldn't figure out what to cut. 
Too many darkly entertaining details, right? Such a weird story with so many twists and turns. How many others living free out in the world right now believe something similar to what they believe? This story made me think about that, right? These fuckers looked and could act when they wanted slash needed to so very normal. No crazy prophet beards, no weird clothes, not out on street corners, you know, preaching strange apocalyptic shit to the general public. I mean, Lori looked like a hot mom who wore fashionable clothes, got many petties, spent a lot of money on her hair, probably did Pilates or CrossFit or something when she wasn't drinking wine with her friends. If I would have seen her at a restaurant or Starbucks, would not have thought twice. She looked like a rich housewife. Chad, uh, you know, he looks like your average suburban dad. Some guy I'd see leaving his accounting or, or law firm on the way home or walking around Home Depot. Some guy at a sports bar watching college football with buddies and enjoying some wings. None of these zombie killers looked cult crazy. Makes me wonder what my neighbors believe right now. I was finalizing these notes at a Starbucks here in Coeur d'Alene and found myself looking at other people drinking coffee and having conversations, working on their laptops and thinking, do they believe the end times are almost upon us? Are they putting together a plan to kill some zombie demons? Something similar? Like what crazy shit are they looking up on their laptops? Not because they're doing research for crazy shit, but because they actually believe it. While Lori was temporarily declared uh, mentally unfit to stand trial, she always knew how to turn on the normal when it helped her, right? When she needed to before she got caught. Part of the fun of what she and Chad were doing seemed to be appearing normal, tricking the rest of us, talking to people at coffee shops, bantering with somebody on the street, thinking the whole time that they were better than us, practically gods on a special divine mission. How narcissistic. Why can't more of us just be cool, doing the best we can with the life we have right here on earth? Just try and be a good person. Try and help take care of your family. Spend as much quality time as you can with your kids, if you have them. Help prepare them for the world. Uh, how to get decent jobs, build decent relationships, not worry about the end times. Uh, call your grandma more often. Write heartfelt cards to people you care about. Volunteer at a shelter. Uh, treat people who are really going through it with some dignity. Smile and say hi to a stranger who looks like they're having a tough day. Tip your waiter or waitress a little extra if you have it. Get off the couch, throw the ball for the dog. Set accomplishable goals. Feel good about attaining them. Have bigger dreams if you want and feel good about just chasing them, even if you never reach them. There is all kinds of good shit you can focus on right here, right now in this realm. No portals needed. No need to concern yourself with who's a fucking zombie, who's a light worker, right? Worry about who your kids are spending time with instead. Worry about your parents and grandparents getting scammed. Worry about, uh, you know, how funded or not your retirement plan is or whether or not you'll be able to get that promotion that you want at work. There's plenty of real shit to worry about right here without having to make things apocalyptic. Pray if you need to, to help yourself, you know, get yourself through the day. Read scripture if it helps you feel better about the world and what may wait for you and your loved ones beyond it. But please don't focus so hard on needing to be a big deal in heaven that you end up being a real piece of shit down here on earth with the rest of us. And don't fucking kill your kids or help anyone else kill theirs. Can you at least do that? Let's head to today's takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Number one. In September of 2019, Lori Vallow sure seems to have talked her brother and possible lover, Alex Cox, into murdering her children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. Cox's phone pinged at the Daybell residence in the backyard where the bodies would later be found, leading prosecutors to believe that he, if he didn't kill them, at least buried them. Number two, for months, neither Lori Vallow nor Chad Daybell would tell anyone where the children were. Lori spun elaborate lies about where J.J. was and eventually fled to Hawaii with Chad, where they got married and lived it up. And definitely uh, wet humped until authorities caught onto them and extradited them back to Idaho. Number three, Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow created an immersive world in which they were reincarnated biblical figures on a divine mission to cleanse the world of evil, even believing they could create portals and use fire and water powers to kill people who they thought were dark. They were dark. Number four, the group attempted to murder and did murder more than Tylee and JJ. Charles Vallow was murdered by Alex Cox, who claimed he'd done it in self-defense. Alex may have been planning to murder Zulema, whom he had just married. There was also a hit out on Brandon Bordreau, the estranged husband of Lori's niece, and of course, the murder of Tammy Daybell. Was all of this done because of a belief in a divine plan, or was it mostly done to collect on insurance money and go on a selfish fuck fest in Hawaii? Number five, new info. Remember those lunatics on Avow? That forum where Chad wrote about his visions and collected followers and prospective authors for his publishing company? Christopher Parrott, the administrator and creator of Avow, would make an apology on the day the bodies were discovered. He wrote, 
It's pretty obvious now that I was lied to and that my trust and faith were horribly abused. It would appear I was dead nuts wrong, and unless Chad wins a lotto in the DNA analysis, comes back showing the bodies are not in fact those of the two missing children, he and Lori will be spending a very long time in prison. Below the post, he pasted a, a picture of a black crow sitting on a white plate with a knife and fork on either side. And beneath it, he wrote, I need to go find a good recipe for crow because I'm going to be eating quite a bit of it for a while now. But uh, eating that crow hasn't stopped him from continu- continuing to peddle more and more apocalyptic bullshit ever since. A vow lives on peddling more dangerous mis- misinformation bound to get more people hurt and more people probably killed. Time suck. Top five takeaways. Lori Vallow, Idaho's doomsday murdering cult mom, has been sucked. Thank you to the Queen of Bad Magic and the rest of the team, including Tyler C., the Suck Ranger, recording this show, and Sophie Evans providing the initial research as we can actually know. Uh, Logan Keith, the Art Warlock, recorded this show. For some reason, I thought Tyler was going to do it when I put the notes out, and I was wrong. Uh, thanks to the Spacers on Patreon for supporting this show. Thanks to the All Seen Eyes moderating the Cult of the Curious private Facebook page, the Mod Squad, making sure the Time Suck Discord channel stays fun. It was great seeing all of you in Lexington recently, by the way. Uh, such a fun show, and you're such a fun crew. And, and thank you for all the, the gifts, the unnecessary gifts you gave me. Uh, thanks to everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and Bad Magic subreddit. And now let's head on over to this week's lighter Time Sucker updates. Updates. Get your Time Sucker updates. Let's start off with some silliness. Uh, with marvelous meat sack Morgan Root <laughs> writing in with a subject line of thanks for getting me out of a Department of Transportation inspection. And then she writes, Lady Trucker Meat Sack checking in from the unofficial a-hole air banjo capital of the world, Arkansas. Dear he who sucketh on high, congratulations, you finally got me. I thought I was good enough to not get Cummins lot after five years of listening to the podcast to let my guard down, thinking, Psh, that'll never happen to me. Boy, howdy, I was wrong. So this is what happened. I was listening to the most recent suck last Tuesday, November 28th, driving across I-30, coming into Texas. I was interrupted by a friend of mine calling, asking a few things when I happened to look ahead and saw, for the first time in my 10-year career, the inspection station coming into Texas from Arkansas open. So I did as any driver would do and pulled in. That's where a state trooper flagged me into the inspection bay. I told my friend, shit, I'm getting expected. I'll call you back when I get out of here. As soon as I hit the hang-up button on my headset and open the door to greet the trooper, my radio kicks in, uh, my radio kicks back on at full blast with you yelling, quote, yes, Aryan daddy, rain your superior non-Jew come upon me, impregnate my face. At this point, I am punching the radio, trying to get it to shut up. And as soon as I did, I turned around to nervously smile at the Texas state trooper and apologize for the radio before I could say anything. He was beet red and his eyes were huge, but he couldn't look me in the eye. (laughs) And he said, well, how about you just go on and get out of here, ma'am, and have a wonderful day. When I say I was mortified, it will be an understatement. But I got to laughing about it, and I got out of an inspection, so I guess you could say a win's a win. Anywho, thank you so much for all the years of entertainment and keep me from complete boredom while being here on the road and always cheering me up with your comedy anytime I go through a rough time in my life. Can't wait to see you again the next time you come through St. Louis or Little Rock. Sincerely, your humble meat sack, Morgan. <laughs> Morgan, what a weird win-win. Very embarrassing, sure, but saved you an inspection. Uh, I can only imagine what that officer has said about that interaction to others. You uh, have for sure been talked about. Glad I can keep you company. Uh, Hope I can continue to do so. Good luck in your next inspection. And next, some very similar embarrassment coming in from Shame Sack Ian Ferguson. Ian writes in with the subject line of Cummins Law and then adds, Well, Dan, I absolutely hate you right now because I just got Cummins Law. This is the first time and I've prided myself on not getting Cummins Law, but it happened. So I had stopped for five minutes, tops, in an IGA parking lot so I could order a Subway sandwich and the exact moment you started saying how Henry Ford and Adolf Hitler <laughs> were going to be coming on each other's faces to make the most powerful demon baby. I love that this was the same moment as the previous uh, message. A really old lady was trying to get into her car next to me and looked horrified. Then I hear, wow, wouldn't it be funny for someone to be Cummins Law by this? You cursed me, dude. Three out of five stars wouldn't change a thing, Ian Ferguson. <laughs> oh my gosh. So much overheard Aryan and Jewish come talk out there in the wild this week. I love it. Uh, not so sure she told anyone about that interaction. Probably not in great, you know, detail. But funny if she did. Like funny if she repeated all of that verbatim. Verbatim. 
my God, I cannot fucking talk today, uh, to her nursing home friends right before they broke out into an orgy. So many old used bikes getting ridden, so many cotton tops, kissing, sucking, licking, thrusting, pegging, ball busting. You get it. And now your Cummins Law message may have just uh, fucked over some others. I can help. One more from Nathan Troutman. Uh, I had some good serious ones this week. I'll try to get more to those next week when I don't have a, a story that's quite so beefy. Nate the, Nate the Great Sack wrote in with a subject line of, look what you did to my daughter. Spoiler alert, I got her pregnant. Uh, JK, but I did talk to her dad's girlfriend about dicks. Nate writes, dear Suckmaster, I just saw you in Lexington at the 630 show on Saturday the 2nd. It was my fourth time seeing you and it was amazing as always. Oh, thank you. My girlfriend Annie was the one you were talking about <laughs> many horse dicks with. Yeah, I was doing a lot of crowd work in Lexington. Uh, where she said it was about the size of a forearm. She hasn't laughed so hard in a long time and it really made her night to interact with you like that. That's not, <laughs> that's not why I'm writing though. I wanted to tell you about my daughter Haley. She's 16 and in a criminal justice class at school and had to do a presentation on true crime. She chose to do it on David Parker Ray and used your podcast for a lot of the research. She actually told me if I got a chance to talk to you at the show to tell you that and thank you. So I'm emailing you instead. What's funnier is her friend in the class chose Ariel Castro and she was having a hard time finding material for her presentation. Just so happened that the Cleveland kidnappings episode came out that week. So Haley told her friend about it and she used the podcast as well. Even said she would start listening to it regularly. Just thought you'd enjoy hearing that and thanks for all you do. You're welcome for the length of the email. Three out of five stars and all that. Thanks and love you, Nathan Troutman. Uh, Nate, I love it. So glad you and your horse-loving girlfriend had a good time with the show in Lexington. And I hope you got a good grade, Haley. And thanks for spreading the suck. Uh, If anyone needs show notes, you know, we have heavily footnoted scripts for all these episodes. You know, uh, we are discontinuing the app, you know, uh, so we won't have them available there. But you can email us at bojangles at timesuckpodcast.com if you need notes for class or whatever. They're very detailed. Lots of... uh, you know, uh, sources listed. Uh, the research has already been done, so you might as well use it. Hail Nimrod, everybody. Thanks, time suckers. I needed that. We all did. Thanks for listening to another Bad Magic Productions podcast. I swear I'm not trying to make these episodes longer. I'm actually trying <laughs> to condense them a bit and just have the best parts. But, you know, what do you do? Scared to death, time suck each week. Please don't kill your husband or wife or kids in order to keep demon zombies from stopping you on your quest to help God during the end times this week, Meat Sacks. Just maybe eat a weed gummy and go to bed. Try and get a good night's rest. Maybe eat a little uh, less sugar or something. Uh, Make sure you're working out. Uh, You need to get your mind right and to keep on sucking. Bad Magic Productions. Another thing this episode uh, really got me thinking about, how, how many grown brothers and sisters are out there dry humping each other or doing more than that? You know, hopefully not many. It's, um, it's not cool if you didn't know that. Don't let all the weird uh, sibling porn on the web that's become very popular fool you. Uh, you're actually not supposed to fuck your sister uh, for a variety of reasons. And even though dry humping, it, you know, it's not quite fucking, it, it is still pretty gross when it's your sister. Uh, if it doesn't bother you morally, let me share a practical reason not to focus on, you know, your siblings for your sexual needs. There, there's not that many of them compared to non-siblings in the world, right? Like if you're, if you're trying to keep it in the family, ah, it just makes dating so much harder. You know, you, you, you know, you got four, five, six, you know, options, probably max, you know, once you get shot down by them, well then, then you're out, you know, you're literally completely out of people now. But if you, if you try to fuck non-siblings, you got bill, billions of potential options. So, you know, if you, if you can't <laughs> stop yourself from trying to rub one out on sissy for, for other reasons, just, you know, focus on the math of it all. I hope that helps. The more you know, I picture a little rainbow star shooting right now.